people who work for the town and all the Good evening. The school board meeting of Wednesday, May 18th, 1994 is now called to order. Uh, the first item on the agenda is adjustments to the agenda. And Bonnie, I believe you have some adjustments. Yes. Um, this time of year, of course, we are uh, busily um, interviewing or uh, posting positions in house. So I will be adding to the under 8E personnel requests, I will be adding a number of staff additions. We also have and it, as part of that, um, a request for a half-time leave, which I will explain at that point. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other adjustments? Okay. I have one, and that is um, that we have three school board members who are here for the last meeting tonight. So I just have a few comments I'd like to make. Maybe they'd like to make a few comments also um, and a little presentation to make. Um, we're sorely going to miss all of you. Um, for the perspectives that you've brought, um, the different experiences um, that you've brought to the board, and certainly your energy. And I think all of you can look back with pride on some of the things that have been accomplished in the last few years. Um, the building uh, referendum was passed, and we're just about to um, start construction on that project. Um, we've made quite a bit of progress, I think, on curriculum issues. It's always slower than we'd like, I think, but I think we have really made some strides in, in all schools. Um, we've learned to live within our financial me means and um, be sensitive to the taxpayers without um, sacrificing the quality of our education. And we've greatly improved the school's business practices. Maintenance is being done as it should be, and operational processes are going much more smoothly. So I think you can all look at those accomplishments and feel that you're leaving the system in much better shape than, than when you got here. Um, Rosemary, <laughs> I'm really going to miss um, your ability to find the true meaning in a long list of numbers that most of us can't, can't fathom. You always seem to find that, that kernel that really is the important kernel. Um, and you've, your outspoken um, search for the truth has been very refreshing. And I only hope that we can all continue to know all the real inside scoop on everything. Once you're gone, I hope you'll still be calling us. Call me. Yes, no. <laughs> and Mark, um, while some of us tend to fly off the handle a bit and go on and on about a subject, you tend to cut right to the quick, <laughs> get to the kernel of it, be able to state the, the problem very succinctly and keep people on focus. And you've kept your focus on curriculum, which is what you set out to do. I think that's great. And Peter, I don't know what we would have done without you in negotiations with your number crunching and your negotiating skills, um, your grace under pressure, and um, your perspective from having spent six years on the board. So we're going to miss that. So um, I'd just like to make a little presentation to each of you, and I'll just kind of bring them down here. I'll start, start with Rosemary on the end. Oops. Mary, this is for you. It's got a little plaque inside here thanking you for your three years of service on the school board. Let <laughs> <laughs> us see if it's spelt right. <laughs> it better be. I didn't yes. check. Connie Brown made sure this happened, so I'm sure it's right. So. I just want you to know in the old days they used to get a plaque. Now we get things we can use. We can use that are pretty. Yeah. Did that come from the um, Lighthouse yeah, Museum? Of course. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Mark, let's make sure I get the right ones here. We have a tray, a tray for you. The Lighthouse also, and this is yours. And I hope it's spelled right. Thank, Thank you, you for much. your great three years. It's I been appreciate a pleasure. it. Pleasure. Thank you very much. <laughs> And Peter, do the men get one thing and the woman gets another? <laughs> <laughs> You're six it's, years. Yeah, we're, we're still struggling with gender bias. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So thank you all very much. Um, your your uh, incredible contribution of time and energy to the kids of Cape Elizabeth, I think, are appreciated by by all of us, and certainly we who are still on the board. Um, and view your, your new time off. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Are you going to let us make brief comments? Go right ahead. Well, I'll be brief. I just want to thank uh, the people of Cape Elizabeth, any of you who voted for me any of the three times. 
or all of you who voted for me all three times. And I uh, just to let you know, it's been a real pleasure to serve uh, the children, um, the staff, and the taxpayers and residents of this town. And I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Just like to thank the uh, many people who have had the chance to work with over the past three years, uh, Superintendent Goldman, uh, members of the board and administration and, and staff at the schools. I've come to uh, be more and more impressed with the high caliber of people involved and every single individual's commitment to furthering the education of children is quite remarkable throughout the system. Thank you. Well, I'm going to miss you all. Uh, but uh, the long meetings, not so much. <laughs> uh, six years is a long time, and I think I've learned the limits of what uh, uh, a fine school system uh, uh, can do. And uh, if I think of one sort of final thought I'd leave uh, uh, with the community, it would be that bringing up children begins at home. And uh, when a child comes into our school system at age five, a lot has already happened in, uh, the, by way of education. And there's a lot more that goes on in the next uh, 10, 15, or 20 years. And it's absolutely essential that the parents continue to be involved, whether it's in the academic part, bringing up children, or in the discipline and uh, morals and ethics. Uh, it absolutely has to be a two-way street, and it has to be a partnership. I think here in Cape Elizabeth, uh, it has been, but we can always do better. And as I leave after these six years, I am absolutely confident that the people who take the three of our places up here at the podium will uh, bring renewed energy and vigor, that this community continues to be dedicated to fine education, and. Uh, I'm going to continue to live in this town, and I look forward to what all of you do in the future. Good luck. We'll be calling on you all, I'm sure. Charles. Can I make a comment? Sure. It's, it's kind of an emotional time for me, because tonight, um, with Peter's leaving, is a passing of the last board member who was on the board when I came on five years ago. Last year, when we lost Loretta and Jan leaving the board, you know, I felt I'd lost a mentor and, and a, a good friend and support from both of those ladies. And with Peter leaving, it's like the original board is gone, and I'm there alone. Even mm -hmm. though the, the board members that are left and the new board members that have just been elected are going to bring such strength to the board, it's, I think it's the historical context of of what board members who have been on the board for a while bring to a board and in helping to make decisions and helping new board members know the context of, of how things, how we arrived at the point that we're at. I'm going to miss um, Rosemary because she was an ally before she ever got on the board. And uh, my phone used to ring a lot. <laughs> and it still rang even after she came on the board, and even as she came on as a uh, town councilor. So I'm going to miss I'm going to miss her, her companionship and her, and her insight, and and I can only echo what Ann has said about Mark. I mean, he he has brought such an insight to the board in his three years, and his his um, pushing for certain curriculum understanding and and changes have uh, have been have been well-founded. I'm going to miss you all. And I, and I feel kind of lonely because, <laughs> because I, you leave me as a senior, as a senior member of the board. But I, I thank Peter for, for watching his process of, of negotiation and his, um, his process of, of, of clarifying and um, of his diplomacy. And I hope I've gained something. Thank you. All of you. Thank you. Thank you. Do I get a word? Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to wait until we get down to my little piece, but I'll say it now. Um, I have to say that over the years as a superintendent, I've been enormously impressed by the um, quality of devotion and the time and the generous and, and cheerful 
uh, service that uh, members of school boards make, and here are three of the best. I've enjoyed very much working with you. Wish you the best. Uh, we'll still keep in touch, and um, thank you for all your work. Okay, now I guess we have a meeting to conduct <laughs> after the politicians have all, you know, hugged each other. <laughs> <laughs> all right. On to approval of the school board minutes from the meeting of April 12, 1994. Are there any corrections, Thomas Charlie? Mm -hmm. Under um, uh, five, I think it's five. No, it's under. Anyway, it's page 31B, and it had to do with the um, energy grant, uh, energy retrofit. And the last line, Rosemary Reed stated that the language in the contract and lease had been reviewed. Had it been reviewed at that point? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Anything else? No. Nope. Minutes stand approved. Okay, the next item is comments by the high school representatives. Do we have any tonight? No high school representatives. Middle school representatives? Oh, they must all be out playing baseball or something tonight. Okay, the next item is communications, and the first is proclamation from the legislature to the swim team, and we have Representative Steve Simons here. Make the presentation. Welcome, Steve. And we have the swim coach. In okay, the and here. Oh, okay. Carrie Curtis is here, and the well, captains. And both the captains, who I'm sorry, I don't. Before we uh, invite them to come up, which I hope they will, to, so the rest of the town can uh, observe them, uh, given the item, first item on your agenda tonight, I'd just like to say that this is a, an unexpected but uh, welcome opportunity for me as one who has served on boards and commissions and now in the state legislature to recognize and to thank and commend the members of this board and especially those who are who will be leaving. Uh, I know as one who will also be leaving an elected position uh, in the not too distant future, I can imagine your mixed feelings of, both regret uh, and some relief. So again, my commendation to all of you, and for the rest of you who are remaining, uh, my sympathies, <laughs> <laughs> but my good wishes and good luck. One of the uh, nice things, one of the nicer things, rewarding things the legislature does is to recognize outstanding achievements uh, and performances by individuals and by organizations. Um, this year, because of the short session, the legislature was being very choosy. Uh, but when they saw the record of the Cape Elizabeth girls swim team, uh, they saw this as something to be recognized. And so uh, they have done so, and it's my pleasure uh, as your representative to convey this recognition. And I wonder if the two co captains of the girls swim team and the coach would come up and position themselves so they will be on camera for the town to see them. The two uh, co-captains are Elizabeth Kerner and Bernadette Sweeney. This is Elizabeth Kerner. No, lady. Oh, yeah, Bernadette. <laughs> Bernadette Sweeney and Elizabeth Kerner. Uh, and coach Kerry Curtis. Um, let me uh, read this, and um, first let me point out too that this was a, um, this is, I'm, I don't follow all athletics all that carefully, uh, but when I did see this and read about it and saw what you did in the last meet in Bangor and that last uh, relay or the relay uh, event that uh, put you ahead and you were key in that relay event, um, Bernadette. Um, I saw this as something to be recognized too with, uh, with high praise. And um, as the town knows, I'm sure everybody in town knows by now that this team has won the state championship three years in a row uh, and always competing against class A teams uh, in the finals. So it's uh, with pleasure that I read to you the proclamation by the state legislature. 
Be it known to all that we, the members of the Senate and House of Representatives, join in recognizing the Cape Elizabeth Girls Capers swim team upon winning its third straight Class A swimming and diving state championship. And be it ordered that this official expression of sentiment be sent forthwith on behalf of the legislature and the people of the state of Maine. Uh, given this seventh day of April, 1994, at the state capitol, Augusta, Maine, signed by the President of the Senate, Speaker of the House, and the Secretary of the Senate and the Clerk of the House. And this was sponsored by myself and co-sponsored by Senator Jane Amaro. And we are delighted and proud and honored to be able to present this recognition. And to you, Coach <laughs> Kerry Curtis, Thank you. who carried on a fine tradition of coaching of the swim teams, and you did it without missing a beat. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, we noticed that the, um, I, the last time I did this, and the only other time I did this, was to recognize the boys' swimming team. I think about three years ago, when they won a state championship, and I noticed that theirs is prominently displayed. And I trust that that's going to be just as prominently displayed, <laughs> too. Probably Congra tomorrow. <laughs> Probably tomorrow. Okay. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Mark? I would, just, I would just like to make a comment that this is an example of what athletics can do for students uh, and uh, individuals uh, when they apply themselves. I, I can't say how strongly I am grateful to Kerry Curtis for his commitment to excellence, his uh, personal leadership and integrity that he has displayed for his swim team. It clearly has uh, shown through in, in members of the swim team. They have conducted themselves with class. Uh, they have performed in an, ex in an exemplary fashion and have achieved everything they meant to achieve. Okay. Um, moving on, communications report from Goals 2000 Conference. Yes. And the, um, I've included in your packet a partial summary of a booklet that Mary Hart, who had attended that Goals 2000 conference uh, included. You might remember earlier in the school year, I um, informed you that she had been invited as one of two teachers to attend this conference. And um, uh, she was very happy to share with us some of the information. Uh, we obviously don't have time to review it all here, but the booklet is making um, the point over and over again that teachers are at the heart of the educational enterprise. Um, they say we have a perspective. These are quotes from the um, material. We have a perspective you can't get from anyone else. Um, the, we've got to turn around the notion that we have to do everything without being given the time to do it, which is a, a really, all of us have to struggle with that as far as how we rethink our schools. And um, finally, we have to join with administrators, community leaders, education professors, and team teach the nation. I thought it was well done, and I thought you would enjoy seeing it. I thank Mary for sending it over. I have a number of other communications. I might as well go right through them. Um, in addition to the swim coach commendations, there, there are three others here that I want to share with you, two of which I received from uh, the commissioner's office and uh, notifications, and one of which um, I will explain when I get to it. Um, the two from the commissioner's office were actually sent directly to Rick DeFusco, the high school principal, about copies to me, and I thought we could uh, share it with the community in this form. Two of our students received prizes in the SPEAR speaking contest. Um, they will be receiving the actual prizes in awards night, I believe, at the high school, right? And, but we're mentioning them tonight. Congratulations to Aaron Broussard, who placed third place in the state SPEAR speaking contest and also to Ben Berman, who received honorable mention in that same contest. Congratulations to both of you. Um, I also think it's important at this time to share uh, information which I believe has already been shared. Um, what was the meeting you went to last night, Rick? Uh, meeting last night was the Western Maine Conference Principals uh, Association. Okay. Recognized students from each of the uh, high schools in the 20 schools represented. Right. And uh, this is uh, this is the the uh, notice I believe you shared. So I'll share it with the board. 
This year marks the 30th year of the United States Presidential Scholars Program. Winners include one young man and one young woman from each state in possession of the United States. The winning scholars are invited to Washington, D.C. for four days in June to attend a White House ceremony and receive a Presidential Scholar Medallion. Selection is based on factors including academic excellence, demonstrated leadership ability, service to school and community, and achievement in a specific field of interest. Cape Elizabeth High School has been fortunate to have had three finalists and four Presidential Scholar recipients in re recent years. 1983, Kristen Ammerling was a Presidential Scholar. 1985, Jean Lambrew was a finalist. In 1987, Jay Wildman was a finalist. And Jennifer Anas, Anas oh help me, pardon me? Anastasia, sorry about that, was a Presidential Scholar. And in 89, Andrew Russ was a Presidential Scholar. And in 93, Lucy Fowler was a finalist. This year, a Cape Elizabeth High School senior has once again been named Presidential Scholar. It is our pleasure to announce that one of the two Presidential Scholars from the State of Maine for 1994 is Erin Adele Pond. Erin is a daughter of Kirk and Loretta Pond. She is a National Merit Commended Student recipient of the Harvard Book Award and Society of Women Engineers Award. A member of the National Honor and Maroon Medal Societies, Erin received the Western Maine Citizenship Award and Academic Awards in Biology, Algebra II, and U.S. History. Erin was elected a Senator at Durago Girls State, is a natural helper, yearbook editor, active in student government, theater, and captain of the varsity basketball and tennis teams. She is a student rescue member and active in the Student Volunteer Council and in her youth ministry. She plans to major in mathematics and economics at Harvard. And I can also add that she was one of the students who volunteered to make phone calls when we were working on the referendum, which was another public service. Congratulations, Erin, and to your parents. We're all proud of you. And moving on. I have a notice here from the Southern Maine Partnership, which is the group consortium of um, about 20 area schools. We've mentioned it from time to time. And in June, they have a very interesting uh, all-day meeting on assessment. And since that's an issue we often bring up and never seem to have enough time to discuss with the board to help you understand what it is, um, actually, this year the partnership is offering a kind of scholarship, which of course is a um, the waiving the conference fee, to one school committee meeting from each partner district, uh, and uh, with the hope, of course, that uh, people will be able to attend. So I have this material, the um, the actual meeting date. Uh, this will be important. Um, conversations on assessments is two days, June 27th and 28th on USM's Gorham campus, and I'm sure that if more than one person wants to go, we can arrange that also. Um, the information is here, and if a school committee member uh, is particularly interested, please let me know. I should also note, of course, that at that date, uh, we are welcoming three new members, and I certainly, as superintendent, want to make sure I see you all here, and also um, one of our other candidates and one we really appreciate your attending we will be giving you a formal welcome at our june meeting and we'll be talking about orientation being in touch with you and uh, certainly want to welcome you on board so if any of you are interested let me know i believe that covers my communications thank okay. you okay yeah i'd just like to add um, you all received in your packet a memo from gary lenoy about the uh the Technology Committee, um, and I've already talked to Charlie about attending um, that meeting because he's obviously shown a strong interest in that, but we're also, I think, going to right now put, put Keith, our new board member, on the spot <laughs> and say, we'd like to see if maybe you, you would also like to attend this meeting, so if we'll just catch up with you um, about that. I think we are making some progress in the computer area now. It's very, it's very, very encouraging. Any communications from anybody else? No? Okay, moving on to superintendent's report. The first item in my report, frankly, is made by somebody else. So Dana is here to report on the results of the National Spanish Exam and French Contest. This is, I think, becoming an annual report. We really appreciate your sharing that with us and turn it over to you. Thank you, Sue. Thank you. 
Good evening. I'm Susan Dana. I'm a 7th and 8th grade Spanish teacher in the middle school. And I'm here tonight as a representative of all the foreign language teachers in the Cape Elizabeth school system, grades 4 through 12. It's with pleasure that I come before you to share the results of the 1994 National French Contest and the 1994 National Spanish Exam. I will briefly describe these competitions, and then I will inform you of the outstanding ranks achieved by our Cape Elizabeth French and Spanish students. The National French Contest is a 60-minute national examination designed, written, supported, and disseminated by the members of the American Association of Teachers of French. Its purpose is to stimulate further interest in the teaching and learning of French and to help identify and reward achievement on the part of both students and teachers. Students are tested on vocabulary, listening and reading comprehension, grammar, culture, and civilization. More than 80,000 students throughout the country took the French exam on March 1, 1994. 28th grade students from the middle school and 35 high school students were selected to take the 1994 National French Test. The results are as follows. From the Cape Elizabeth Middle School, placing first in the level 1B is Julia Lopez. Placing second, these are state ranks. So first in the state, Julia Lopez. Second in the state, Heidi Daniels. Third in the state, Aaron Sullivan. And fifth in the state, Emily Scotton. These scores were um, so high that they also placed in the New England regionals. Um, in the 1994 New England regional ranks of the National French Contest, Julia Lopez placed fifth, Heidi Daniels placed sixth, and Aaron Sullivan placed seventh. Um, I'd just like to put in a plug for the FLESS program and say these are all eighth graders and they're all um, in the, started out in fourth grade French in the FLESS program. Um, for the high school, of the 35 high school students that took the National French test, all scored above the state average. Of particular note are the performances by the following students. Level 1 French, 4th in the state, Jennifer Cannell, 8th in the state, Joy Cranshaw. Level 2 French, 4th in the state, is Noelle Milliard, 7th in the state, Neely Dane, and scoring in the top 20%, Mimi Parker. On the level 3 French exam, scoring in the top 10% are Jamie Riccio, Chris Roberts, and Amy Kirsting. And scoring in the top 20% of the level 3 French exam, Mandy Cox and Lisa McKinney. In the level four French exam, scoring in the top 20%, Katie Oliviero, Rebecca Skolnick, and Shana Stevens. In the level five French, national French test, first in the state, Tina Weschler. Fifth in the state is a tie, Matt Wright and Mike Milliard from Cape Elizabeth. And scoring in the top 20% on the level five exam is Rebecca Goldfein. Similar to the national French contest, the national Spanish exam is an academic competition sponsored by the American Association of Teachers of Spanish and Portuguese, or AATSP. The exam is given in March of each year throughout the United States, and any student whose teacher is a member of the AATSP is eligible to participate. Generally, schools select only their top students to compete, so those who take the exam are competing against other very capable Spanish students. The exam is comprised of 80 questions. 30 listening comprehension questions, and the remaining 50 questions test reading comprehension, vocabulary, and grammar. A mean score of 40 correct, or 50%, is the goal of the AATSP. It is a very rigorous exam because it must finally distinguish the various levels of language acquisition, thereby enabling the AATSP to award significant prizes to the highest scorers. The state chapter of the AATSP recognizes the top 15 scores at each level. And the results of the 1994 National Spanish exam are as follow, follows. The middle school results for the level one exam, third place, Jeff Haddam, fourth place, Wyatt Jackson, ninth place, Andrew Townsend, and 11th place in the state, Patrick Newell. And the high school results are as follows for the 1994 National Spanish exam. For the level one exam, uh, first place, Andrew Butterworth, that's first in the state. 14th in the state, Kristen B. Allen, she's a junior. And 15th in the state, Kristen C. Allen, who's a freshman. The level two exam, placing fifth in the state, Zach Hornby. Placing sixth in the state, Heather Corley. Placing ninth in the state, Sarah Nemitz. 13th in the state, Mandy Johnson. And 14th in the state, Fran Benoit. In the level three Spanish exam, placing first in the state, Jennifer Cannell. Placing sixth in the state, Lawrence Stevens. Placing 10th in the state, Alana Berman. And in the advanced level national Spanish exam, placing seventh in the state, Hillary Schwartz. 
Um, I would just say for the level two and the level three, seven of the eight students that placed in the state are also, they're all freshmen and they are the result of the PLUS program. Um, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer questions. Otherwise, those are the results. Any questions? That's very impressive. Very encouraging. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Um, I guess if we, if you have a copy of that, we would be happy to enter that into our, our minutes and uh, or accompanying them anyway in our packet book. And um, congratulations to all of you, teachers and students, for your hard work. Moving on, uh, last month I talked uh, in the continuing discussion of various quality projects. Um, I told you I was trying to put together an innovative grant. In the meantime, I, as uh, the board knows and some of the staff, I had an opportunity to um, participate in a pretty intensive seminar on a, um, a development, a human development kind of training program that many of the, a number of large corporations now are beginning to use called Human Dynamics. I'm looking forward to an opportunity to share what I have learned with all of you. And I think the best way for me to do that will be to set up a series of one to two hour presentations. I'll be doing that with the administrators this Friday. Any of you who are available and would like to attend that, I'd be happy to uh, welcome you. I'll also be doing it with staff. I think it's really important for teachers to see some of this material as we go forward and plan how we might be able to make use of it. At any rate, once I really got into the middle of the intensive training, I realized I wasn't going to be able to pull together a credible uh, grant at this time. I certainly think I can do it in a future space. I did uh, uh, take the uh, materials with me and, and worked on it, but um, an important part of the state innovative grant process now is a systemic approach, and there simply isn't time for me to meet with all the staff in all three buildings and share uh, this material uh, by the May 27th deadline. Also present it to you for your vote and present it to the Quality Council, which is another piece of the vehicle. It does have to be a parent and teacher uh, and school board group that uh, um, votes on it. So we're going forward with the work, uh, if not with a grant, but I, I believe that's something that will come at a later time and I really don't want to uh, rush the work. I'd be happy to answer. Can, can I just ask, is that a grant that is given every year? Yes. So, in other words, maybe we could start planning now to, right, make exactly. it, yeah. to uh, right. do that for next year. Right. Okay. And uh, that's, uh, I really was impressed with the evolution of the innovative grant process. I've seen it over the years. I hadn't looked at it for the last couple of years. And uh, it, while far more rigorous, it is stress, uh, stressing systemic approaches. We're really interested now in having all buildings involved in a shared vision. And I think that's something that we've made some stabs at, but it's important to keep that, that in mind. Okay, moving on. Um, transition committee, I know we have under the school board subcommittees a report from the school building committee, and I assume at that point, um, whoever is reporting will talk about the planning board meeting last night. I'll take this opportunity, however, to say a few things. Um, it was certainly clear at the planning board meeting that um, we need to be proactive in uh, reaching out to the community as well as to our own staff and students and final preparations for our uh, actual renovation work, which begins this summer. The issue of um, compiling lots of information about exactly what is going on when uh, is complicated and we have put together a very able group of teachers and administrators who are working on the immediate first phase which is how do we plan to pack everything up, get it out of both of those buildings totally so that we can prepare for the asbestos removal which has to start the last week in June. It's no mean task. At one point we were estimating we were going to need something like 11,000 boxes. Uh, we have managed to cut that number down considerably. Um, and we have phase after phase and sticky tapes and all kinds of planning diagrams. So I want to assure everybody that there's a lot of work going on right now that we simply haven't necessarily gotten out to people. Uh, one of the things that um, was raised last night was concern about the effect of uh, various effects of having a construction project with kids and teachers in schools. How do we manage that? Um, the specific issue focused on uh, the issue of blasting, but 
uh, our professionals were explaining how that is done, although we will be notifying people and working out ways of doing that. Uh, fortunately, most of that blasting will be going on in the summer. We will have ample opportunity to look at the buildings themselves and see what effect, if any, there is, uh, which will guide us in how we deal with children once the year uh, goes on and they have to complete any particular blasting pieces. Um, it is going to be important for us to get the kids to understand how important it is to stay away. Everything will be fenced. Everything will be clearly marked off grounds. Um, there will be no possibility for anybody doing what they're supposed to do to get in there. Of course, we all know kids, and we know that um, there are afternoon or late evening or other opportunities for people to be curious and climb fences. So we will be doing educational programs with students. We will also, of course, be educating uh, staff. Um, maybe we could hand out hard hats to everybody, but um, I think there will be times when we will use hard hats, but not in the classroom. We won't need to do that. Uh, we will clearly have a need to send home um, probably almost a newspaper. Uh, we'll be talking about how many times we can do it and what kind of information will be in there. Um, the ones that have the most important information will get mailed because we don't necessarily think they all get home, just hand them out. Uh, we'll make use of cable TV, regular TV, the Cape Courier. Uh, we'll ask the, our, uh, the Portland paper to help us in uh, general explanations. I'm sure there are a variety of ways by which we can keep people informed so that they know in advance what's going on. We do believe that defusing the rumors or, or giving you good information will help you handle this in a variety of ways. So all of those things now are going on um, under the kind of title of transition committee and there will be more coming. Any question on that? Okay. It's a lot of work <laughs> and I commend the people who are involved. Scott's been doing a lot of it. Sue Weatherby, who is here, is invaluable. And some of our total quality training is actually being put to use. We're getting much more organized how we draw up lists of steps for things. Uh, we also have representatives here from the middle school. I see Nancy Hotton and Charlotte Hanna. And you had included in your packet a recommendation for seventh grade math, math course changes. So I'm asking if would ask them to come up and summarize that for you. Hello, I'm Charlotte Hanna. I teach eighth grade math, and I also help with math curriculum coordination at the middle school. Uh, I come to you tonight to present a proposal for a change in our seventh grade math programming. Uh, I know that you have a memo to that effect, but some of our listeners do not, and so I'll begin with a, a brief introduction to that, uh, what the proposal is, and the rationale behind the proposal. First, I must clarify a term that we use a lot at the middle school, which is transitional math, and it should really be known as transition math. Transition math is the name of a textbook that is the first in a series of textbooks put out by the University of Chicago School Mathematics Project. It has come to be known as the name of a course at the middle school that uses as its core the transition math textbook so that it can be used um, both for the textbook and for the course. Our uh, proposal tonight has to do with that course transition math. The way our programming currently stands, transition math can be uh, taken by a student at one of three grade levels, sixth, seventh, or eighth grade. Our proposal will not affect those students who take it early as a sixth grader. Those students will continue through the sequence at the middle school, taking algebra as a seventh grader and geometry as an eighth grader. Our proposal does affect students who take transition math as a seventh grader. Our current program has had those students entering algebra as, an, as eighth graders, and we have come to find that there are a number of concerns uh, around that programming, which I'll describe to you. There also has been a course at the seventh grade level for, for students who have not taken transition math. That's been called rational math because of the emphasis on rational numbers, fractions, decimals, and work with percent. In the memo, it outlines at the beginning our, our basic proposal. The first thing is that we propose to eliminate the current rational math program. Instead of offering transition for most seventh graders as a one-year program, we propose to offer transition math as a two-year program for most seventh graders, delaying their entry into algebra until their freshman year of high school. 
We also still propose to offer the one-year transition math for a smaller number of students who can make good use of the textbook-based approach and cover the entire textbook in one year, but that number would be reduced. I'd like to speak next about the rationale behind this proposal. One thing we have noticed in the last few years is that the large number of algebra students in eighth grade, in that number, there are quite a few who struggle with the eighth grade algebra programming. Along with that, we see negative attitudes develop concerning their abilities in mathematics and their performance. We've heard students talk about trying to get through their high school math requirements early because uh, they've had a tough time with it and they would like to, to get through with it. And we're very upset about those consequences. There are also developmental concerns. Uh, we all know from Piaget and other studies that abstract thinking comes at various ages for people. But usually it's talked about somewhere between the ages of 13 and 14, maybe 15, 16, maybe later. We have a concern with students taking algebra, which is a very abstract subject, without having developed to that level. There are a number of experts who uh, say that algebra should be postponed till a later year. The NCTM, National Council of Teachers of Math, makes a strong statement about the percentage that should be in algebra as eighth graders. James Garvin, who is the middle school guru we've heard a lot from, uh, opposes strongly having high numbers of eighth graders in algebra. We also see in surrounding communities that algebra is not offered to large numbers as we do. The, co the communities that I'll just note briefly are Falmouth and Greeley. In Falmouth, eighth grade algebra is not even offered. Uh, a few, less than a handful, may enter the high school for their algebra programming, but it is under five each year. A second problem with the current setup is that transition math, uh, we can only cover 75% of the textbook the way we are working now. It's a very excellent textbook. It's um, chock full of good ideas but we can only cover about three quarters of the material. By spreading it over two years, we'll be able to cover it all and cover it much better. We also find that many seventh graders uh, and eighth graders are constrained by a real pure textbook approach. And we would like to vary that more with long-term problem solving projects, process-oriented investigations, which are a real push of the NCTM standards. I did bring a few copies of, of a summary of those standards if, if anyone is interested. We also find that by not completing the transition math material that we squeeze the Algebra I curriculum in the following year. The algebra teachers have to spend some time on material that we did not get to and that causes them to not get so far in their algebra programming. So that's the rationale and, and what we're proposing to do and Nancy and I would be glad to take any questions. Rosemary. Charlotte, this is the one I didn't ask you on the phone. Okay. So I just thought of it. Um, so the students that will be uh, going at the accelerated pace, will they be entering honors courses at the high school? Is uh, that the intent? When you're talking about accelerated pace, you're talking about the seventh graders who would take transition math as a one-year program? Yes, and then... They go on to uh, algebra in the eighth grade, and we do teach the algebra at the same pace as the high school honors program. So the expectation would be honors, honors geometry, geometry except the following year. I must add that if we stretch transition math over two years for seventh and eighth graders, we would expect that a good number of those children would also enter an honors algebra program in their freshman year of high school. And I, I do want, for the people who are at home and don't know that we asked this question. The high school will be prepared for these students when these students arrive there because they know they're coming. Yes, um, we've been in conversation at length with Sam Boothby. Uh, Sam was also attending the presentation that we gave to parents a few weeks ago on this topic and they are fully supportive of the proposal. Thank you. Yes. Um, I know I asked you this one on the phone, but I'm going to ask it again. Um, are the concepts that are currently covered in the rational math, which is going to be eliminated, are those concepts covered in the new transition math format? By stretching transition math over two years, we open up lots of time for other types of activities. Um, Tom Wilbur and John Casey developed the rational math program. 
Uh, it's, it does not have a textbook as its core. It has activities and materials that they've put together. They also will be teaching in, in these beginning years the two-year program if we go ahead with that. And the plan is for them to incorporate the best parts of the rational math programming into the time that we will have in the first year of transition math. And did you also say that there still might be some sixth graders that might take transition math? Yes, we've uh, just completed the testing that we do at this time of year to try and identify students who have pretty much mastered rational number computation as well as uh, the concepts and, and the other important uh, things before they would take transition math. they take math. the new two-year format? No, they would still take, would take ra uh, transition math in one year as sixth graders. We have three years of experience with that. And we find that that small group, and that small group we're talking around 15% of sixth graders, uh, have a great deal of success with taking it at that fast pace. And then they would go to algebra in seventh grade? That's right. My question, I think you've already uh, partly answered at least. In, in talking at least with some teachers and in, re in reviewing with some parents a transitional math course, one of the concerns is the ability to achieve mastery of at least some basic concepts in that format. And I just wanted to see if a part of the additional time that's available would be used to be certain that those children are able to achieve some mastery in basic concepts as they go along. Yes. Um, as we've used transition math, we have supplemented it since the first year we used it with a great deal of review of computational skills and so forth, so that when children leave the transition math program, they don't have just the overall um, connection, which is very important, mm -hmm. between algebra, geometry, arithmetic, and so on. But they also have very firm computation skills in both paper and pencil and mental math. By doing this, we have even more time to, to look at those concerns. The uh, authors of the series, Zalu Siskin in particular, is a firm believer that mastery at this level is not required. And they believe in the spiral approach of coming back and touching topics again and again throughout the years of high school math, starting with transition math. Uh, we like that approach, but we believe that we do need more mastery than, than we have been getting and trying to go through at the pace that they recommend. Thank you. What are the numbers that you project for the single seventh grade transitional math program? All right. We, we project, as I said before, around 15% for the sixth grade one-year transition math. Beyond that, at this point, we have identified 20 students who scored at a high level on the tests that we give and also have strong teacher recommendation to enter the one-year program. That's about 14%. There are another 12 or so students, about another 10%, who are a bit borderline. They have teacher recommendation with some reservations. Their scoring on the test was about where we would like them to be, but a little bit lower. We're in the process now of discussion. I'm making phone calls to those parents, and their teachers are as well, to talk about whether it would be best for those children to take a two-year program or would we like them to go ahead and attempt the one-year program? So we're talking somewhere between 27 and 35 percent, counting the sixth graders who are in advanced programming. The rest, then, would be in the two-year two program, taking algebra in freshman year. So if, for some reason, the, the marginal 10 percent should not be able to keep up, because I don't want Mm -hmm. the, essentially, that seventh grade program was just going to be a little more accelerated than what it is now. Those, there's going to be in the scheduling the opportunity for those children to be able to, to um, transfer into a two-year program. During the seventh grade year? During seventh grade we year. We do try to accommodate that as much as schedules will allow. Uh, so that is a definite possibility. Those students will also have the option, if they take the one-year program and it hasn't been as successful as they or their parents hoped, they could enter the part two as eighth graders yes, instead of going on to algebra. I just want to make sure there are options because this is one of the problems with the high school schedule is that children get into programs that when it's time to, to transition to you know, a CP course from an honors course, there aren't a lot of options. And I want to make sure that children have options. What we would try to do, Charlie, is um, <clears throat> with that, our second class of the fast-paced program, if we have 35 students, that's where we would have the two classes of the faster-paced program in seventh grade. We try to back 
um, at least one of those classes up with, the, uh, with a transition math part one course so that it would be relatively easy to change the schedule. I can't guarantee that we can do that with both classes, but we would try very hard to make sure we could do that with at least one of the classes okay. so that it wouldn't change their entire schedule. Um, one more, Charlotte. Um, in that, there'll be two teachers teaching the two-year program? Yes, if our numbers get up as high as we expect, there'll be two classes of the one-year program at seventh grade. Okay. Is your expectation that they will both be taught at the same pace? Yes. Thank you. Any other questions? And th this is actually just a comment about the process. I'm very much grateful for your effort in explaining this to the board. Um, I think it's helpful so that for both the board and the community to have an understanding of where significant curriculum concepts are going within the school systems. And it's been uh, presented in a very clear fashion. I, I would hope that we could emulate um, that type of communication with other, other core curriculums in the school systems in addition to the math system. Thanks. Thanks, Charlotte. Thank you. I would agree. Just one, one question about, I know the Chicago program had, had a high school program and it also had an early elementary program. How is the, the fourth, fifth program developing? Is it preparing children to be more the, readily available, I mean, the, more readily uh, everyday, everyday Mathematics is the title of the uh, K through 6 uh, sequence that is published by a different publisher but was written by the University of Chicago program. Uh, we have that in place in grades K through 3. And, and the fourth grade programming is going to be available this summer. So we have not introduced it yet into the fifth and sixth grade. The fifth grade, um, publication date for their materials is a year from now and the sixth grade the following year. So are you finding children better prepared than they were, say, three years ago when you started instituting the transitional math program? Frankly, we haven't had the students who have been in the everyday mathematics come up through okay. yet, um, so I can't answer that. Our expectation is that they would have much better understanding of the links among uh, different aspects of mathematics. Okay, the, the skills that children seem to, to lack or not have enough experience with when they went into transitional math, are you finding that the, the fourth and fifth grade programs are now supplementing um, more skill approach so that they are prepared with a rational aspect? For the number computation? Yes. What we're seeing is that there's an increased emphasis. I was at a meeting um, at Pond Cove just yesterday to talk about uh, computation skills as well as other things at the early grade levels. And I know that teachers at all grade levels are trying to increase the amount of time that's, that's used for review of basic skills. Okay, thank you. Charlotte, can we just ask that next year about this time you come back or at the end of the year, just let us know how it's worked out worked out the way you expect. She's not going to be here. Oh, that's right, Charlotte, you're going to be here. That's Nancy will Nancy will come. Sorry, Steve will come. <laughs> Sorry, Charlotte, God, have a good year. <laughs> Thank you, Charlotte and Nancy. Um, and the final item on my report was the school budget, which is really just uh, noting the fact that it has been finalized and uh, that the Bottom line is the same as it was, minus the 30,000 plus cut in the final subsidy round. But our agreement with the board, uh, with the council, of course, was to uh, have a zero increase budget, operating budget, uh, to make room for the um, school bond project. Uh, I don't think there's anything now for us to discuss except to say that we will live within that budget. Rosemary? I just wanted to make a comment that uh, Scott Poole and I attended the town council's adoption of the budget and when the final action on the budget was uh, approved uh, the tax rate remained the same at 1770 so there was no uh, cost per mill increase uh, when the town and school budgets were finalized. A lot of people missed that. <coughs> okay. And that, that's with the bonding. That's with our bonding included. So, moving on. That's my okay. report. Okay, the next item is school board subcommittees and reports. The first is finance subcommittee and 
Peter, I turn it over to you for the last time. Good. Uh, this is uh, not a very exciting report <laughs> tonight. Uh, we met, as we always do. The public's always invited. Uh, this evening's agenda was uh, pretty routine. Most of our hard work is behind us. Uh, we reviewed the lunch program. We, uh, we set the uh, tuition rates for the Children's Center for next year. We talked about the Blue Cross Blue Shield rates uh, for next year, which fortunately came in uh, pretty much on budget. Uh, and we signed the warrants. And that is uh, my final report of the Finance <laughs> Committee, unless uh, there are some questions. No, most of us were there. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Okay, moving on to school building committee, and Charlie, I'll turn it over to you. Um, as of last night's planning board um, vote, um, we are, I think, well on our way to uh, of really starting the implementation in, in July of, of the building process. Uh, we now have zoning board approval, and we also now have planning board approval, which we needed for DEP approval, which will take place sometime in, in June. Um, we needed both of those approvals in order to get DEP approval. Um, as of last weekend, um, the, um, the bid process was opened up by um, advertising in um, the appropriate, appropriate sources, such as newspapers. As of the pre-opening um, um, bid process, we had 18 pre-qualified uh, construction corporations who had submitted pre-qualifications and had been approved. So we have the possibility of 18 contractors bidding on this project. Um, the construction documents are at 95% complete as of our last meeting last week. Um, there were only a couple um, minor revisions. Um, one of those had to do with lockers in the middle school and uh, additional sinks in seventh and eighth grade classrooms, uh, science classrooms. Um, we have another uh, building committee meeting tomorrow night and I believe the documents are now at 99% <laughs> complete. Um, and I think that we are looking very good, uh, both from a bonding sense um, at the town council approval of, of the budget for next year and setting the tax rate, it was realized that we will save $200,000 by our first payment on, on the bond which actually they are only going out to bond for 11.5 million. So in the long run, it looks like we, you know, the town is going to get a lot for their money and due to um, very, very prudent uh, bonding and a lot of hard work, both on the part of the zoning board and both on the part of the planning board and our architectural firm and the uh, school department and the school building committee, um, we are right on target. And I have to uh, applaud them all. It is truly a one town effort. I certainly would echo that. <laughs> yes, as grueling a process it, as it has been at times, I think people are going to be very pleased when they start seeing this building going up. I think it's going to be a building we can be proud of for a very long time to come. And we have stayed within the budget. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's really, really been a, a project. And, and it's, uh, I think it is a, a mark of the town that the, uh, that the volunteer citizens and all of these boards, including, of course, the school board and the building committee, it's uh, just astonishing to me how many hours people are putting in. Um, and we also, uh, in addition, I should point out, we have staff putting a lot of hours in on this, too, in addition to their work, and will continue to do so. So it is um, one of those, um, I guess, what was it, Winston Churchill kind of times when it's sort of, at, at moments, it feels like we're in the Battle of Britain, but at the same time, um, we're going to get through this, and it's um, something that needs to be done. Anybody else? Okay, moving on to the Policy Subcommittee and Rosemary. Thank you. The Policy Subcommittee uh, had its regularly scheduled meeting on May 4th. 
Uh, and at that time, we reviewed several issues, uh, two of which are on your agenda under new business, the discussion and uh, possible action on deletion of a school board policy on the enrollment of non-resident employees' children, which I'll be discussing under that segment, and also a first reading on the policy for the assignment of students to classes, uh, specifically the five-year-olds. One of the other items that we discussed under the policy subcommittee, which appeared in the uh, May 11, 1994 Portland Press Herald article, uh, captioned, Kate Panel Examines Ways to Halt Drug Use. Uh, in this article, the names of the nine-member committee was stated as were the reasons for the establishment of this committee. The committee will focus on the community-wide issue of alcohol and drug abuse by its residents. The goal of the committee is, ex is expected to be a community-wide drug policy, not just a school and police agreement. Within the framework of the organized group, recommendations will be made with subsequent policies and procedures established to provide for consistent practices when the police department and or school department realizes that an incident may have occurred. We'll be collecting data from the middle schools and the high school to determine the scope and severity of our problems. The police agree that this is not totally an enforcement issue. It's not totally a school issue. It is a community issue, and that is our broad focus. There will be parental involvement needed, as well as the understanding by the community at large of the intent of this committee. The school board has committed itself to collect this data on the drug as well as discipline issues in the middle and the high schools and to determine what needs to be done to correct these situations. We plan to advertise, circulate, and enforce the resulting policies and procedures. The school board will be addressing these issues uh, in its purview and the police department the issues in theirs. Implementation is planned for September of 1994. Thank you. Okay, there was nothing else under policy? I don't think so. It's well, there's a lot pending that the next policy committee chair will be able to <laughs> report on next meeting. <laughs> right. Any questions? I just want to extend an apology to two members of that committee who were not notified in a timely manner. So I, I publicly apologize. Connie wasn't here, and I dropped the ball. Okay, so that's why you were not notified in a timely manner. That's Phil Jewett and Rick DeFusco. And we do not have a meeting scheduled yet. We'll be in touch with you and sit down and talk about what we need to do. It won't require too much work on your part. Rosemary. And where other people volunteered, you gentlemen were drafted. <laughs> <laughs> Carla, did you have, did you, I thought there's something. Nobody raised their hand. Okay. Yeah. All right, moving on to unfinished business, calendar for 1994 and 95 school year. Okay, um, we did distribute the calendar at our last meeting and have had subsequent administrative um, and teacher <coughs> discussions. I made sure the teacher association had a copy of the proposed dates um, because we do have a of an advise and consult um, role with the teacher association on calendar although I should also of course remind you that the it is a school board um, duty to set the calendar a state statute requires at least 180 days five of which are teacher workshop days 175 teacher pupil days um, and that's the framework with which within which we are working um, the issues just to go back over them a little bit um, the middle school had brought up at our last board meeting their interest in going to trimesters and pursuant to your uh, approval of that, you will note on this proposed calendar the little uh, triangle, which I think is a nice way to, it was, uh, Connie is the one who, who actually gets to type this up and try to put symbols that on one calendar that can easily be read, and I thought that was a good solution. Those dates were suggested to us by the middle school staff. Um, I should note that Pond Cove is interested in this, but there's no particular reason or, as I understand it, immediate need to change that, but it might be something in the future. Um, the high school, um, partly at least because of semester courses, is staying with the normal quarter. And I understand that, Rick, you have a statement you want to read about possibly changing one of the quarter dates here. 
uh, under the, uh, the current draft that, that's in your packet, it has the first quarter uh, ending on the uh, 10th of November uh, to give us 45 pupil days in the first quarter and only 40 in the second. Uh, after meeting with the high school faculty on Monday, we would like to propose that, that we move the end of the first quarter to Friday the 4th, which would give us 41 days, but 44 in the second quarter, which is more prone to snow days or days uh, we're concerned with a 40, uh, under the current uh, proposal, there would be 40 school days, uh, uh, student days uh, in the second quarter, and with snow days involved, it, if they're there, it would really uh, be difficult to do that. By moving it back to the fourth, um, it also allows us to be closer to our conference time, too, where the, where the end of the quarter is, is the fourth, and then having conferencing the week before. That's the proposal from the, the high school faculty, if we could Again, just move that quarter uh, at the end of the first quarter from November 10th back to November 4th. Peter? Is the practice to take a snow day and add it to the fourth quarter? No, we generally add it to the, the second semester, but because of our rotation and schedule, it, it impacts. We have mid-year exams. Uh, we could do that, but it, it, it's not. It's still 41 days. The, the, the way you explained it, I understood as uh, that day, if there was a snow day, it was lost to that quarter. In other words, you, you propose 44 days for the second quarter on the presumption that two or three days would be uh -huh. lost to snow days and that, th that that will be a 41 or a 42 day quarter. Well, my question is, if that's true, are those snow days added to some other quarter? Well, we did and this year. if so, year, why? Okay, another way, I'll give you an example. This year we had, uh, I think we had, of the five snow days, or four snow days, three of them fell on the same A day of our schedule, which really impacted some of the other classes that would meet. We had to make a determination how we were gonna use the four snow days and not have eliminate, it's hard to describe, but, but eliminate uh, some periods that wouldn't meet if we just went, replaced them with those four A days. There would have been classes that wouldn't have met at all because of the elimination of two periods per day. So we really try to take in consideration uh, what courses, um, uh, what classes have been missed. I know it's real confusing, and I apologize. Um, but what this would do is was alleviate that potential of one or two days would be there, but uh, the possibility of more than that uh, would impact our schedule. Okay, Connie. Yeah, I th I think that that's certainly true as far as the high school schedule is concerned. But in a simpler way, yes, Peter, if we miss snow days, they're made up mm -hmm. at the end so that we would be adding ultimately the last quarter could wind up with uh, 49 or 50. But because it is the end of the year, I mean, it's really, it's a matter of where we put the marks. We have the 175 days. And if this is going to simplify things for the high school and get a little better handle on the impact on the particular schedule they have, I don't see anything. I understand, thanks. Well, I think it's an excellent idea, especially since at the second term is your midterms. Mm -hmm. So it makes all sorts of sense with that snow day. Sorry for the problem. confusing state uh, explanation. Thank you. <laughs> it's, it's the <clears throat> meshing of so many different schedules. Maybe we'll evolve into a um, self-organizing system which will somehow cure all this, but we haven't gotten there yet. All right, that's my, all my okay. comments on the calendar. But just for clarification, um, that request came from the high school. It doesn't impact the middle school. And is Pawn Cove all right with that? Okay. Can I just ask if there was anybody here from the public who wanted to speak on the calendar issue? No? Okay. All right, any board comments about the calendar? Carla? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I do have a few comments, and I do also have one letter from a parent who would have spoken if they could have come, and I will make my comments first, and then I will read the letter. Um, and I apologize for reading my comments. Um, since last month, when we first discussed the calendar issue, I have given it a great deal of thought. I now strongly feel that the first day of school should be September 8th and not September 7th. A school calendar is meant to reasonably accommodate as large a population of the school community as possible while containing the mandated number of student days. If we were talking about an unreasonable combination, I would not be here trying to argue the point. I don't feel that one more day is an unreasonable accommodation. I suggest that we make December 23rd a school day to keep the correct number of days in the calendar. December 23rd is not a holiday. It is simply the Friday before a vacation, a vacation, I might add, that is always built around Christmas. 
We do not get the Friday off before February vacation. We do not get the Friday off before April vacation. I don't see any defensible reason to get December 23rd off other than to recognize and condone the habit of taking children out of school early before vacation. September 6th and 7th this coming school year are both comprise a very important Jewish holiday. While this holiday is usually not a day off from school and is usually not expected to be a day off from school, excuse me, it does happen to occur this coming school year on what would be the first day of school for some people. We do have a policy of no new work or tests on these holidays. I feel that the first day of school comprises major new work. It's very rare, and I want to stress this, it's very rare for these holidays to occur this early in the fall. This is not likely to occur again soon or even to occur again. Um, no one expects these holidays to regularly become days off school. This is an anomaly because it is so close to the beginning of school. Um, for people who might not quite be aware, these holidays have the equivalent importance, I guess, of Easter or Christmas. While Easter always falls on a Sunday, I've never seen a public school open on Christmas Day. Um, we teach diversity to our children in school. I feel we should set an example of practicing tolerance for diversity. We should not further single out a minority population within our community if we can accommodate them fairly reasonably. A school start date of September 8th would allow all our students to attend the first day of school and allow more of our staff to attend a September 7th staff day. And incidentally, this will also give our construction project one more grace day. Um, and I wasn't going to further comment, but I have had several comments to the effect of what are other school districts doing. I can quite honestly say most other school districts are starting on the 7th. However, I truly don't feel that we need to base all our decisions on what other people are doing, especially where this will not change the ending date of school, it will not change the number of days, and we are already experiencing a late start. Um, and that's the end of, end of my comments. I will now read the letter. The letter is addressed to um, Ann Chapman as the chair of the board. Dear Ann, it says, in accordance with the traditional two-day observance of the Jewish New Year, and because the second day of this holiday, this specific academic year, 1994-95, falls on the proposed start of the Cape Elizabeth School System, I encourage you to delay the opening of school by one day until Thursday, September 8, 1994. For the most part, whenever there has been a scheduling conflict involving a Jewish holiday and a school function, I have conferred with the appropriate people and satisfactorily resolved the issue. Easy solutions have reduced or eliminated the potential discomfort for the student, the family, and the Jewish community. In this case, I presume no student would want to miss the first day of school under any circumstance, and I presume that no student whose family expects Jewish New Year religious service attendance would want to deal with the conflict of attending one or the other. I remind you that there is a school policy in effect that ensures respect for religious observance. These two days constitute, plus Yom Kippur, constitute the holiest days of the Jewish calendar. Understanding that some of the Jewish families in Cape Elizabeth may observe Rosh Hashanah for one day or would send their children to school on the second day if the day represented the opening day of school, I shall feel tremendous pride if you do grant this delay and defer to those families observing two days for the Jewish New Year. Thank you very much for your understanding, and that's a letter from Roberta Gordon. Thank you. Why don't you come up and just tell us who you are. My name is Gail Atkins, and I come from a mixed religious family. Half the family is Catholic, and half the family is Jewish. And I support uh, both Carla's comments and Bobby Gordon's comments, and I think they should be strongly considered by the school board. Thank you. Charlie. I was just wondering, there were some, some elements of Carla's um, discussion that I felt had some merit. One was questioning the 23rd, the, the Friday before, for a essentially um, a Christmas break. Um, and I think she made a valid point. Um, the other is to do with the Thursday workshop day, teacher workshop day and then having essentially four days off and then coming back for another teacher workshop day. I wonder how effective you know, the continuity of that would be for the four day break in between. And would it, would, would it not be more effective to have, as Carla said, 
Tuesday and Wednesday being the workshop days, so they are con succinct. So I, I think I kind of support her. Not, not, for, not for the religious aspect, but more for continuity and equity. Uh, Did you have something the that? workshop day was, um, there were two purposes suggested for that. Normally we only have one, sometimes we do have two. Again, we were trying to offer a window of opportunity for unpacking. Um, since there is, particularly at the middle school, um, a tight schedule for the asbestos removal, the way that is going to happen is that pieces of the building will be turned back to staff in a gradual way. That is, we understand Pine Cove will be available to us for putting things back in and then teachers coming in and trying to set up their rooms. Um, certainly, we hope by early August, but we still don't know exactly. Uh, with the middle school, uh, frankly, they are telling us that they, they don't expect to be totally out of there until September 1st. So that was one of the things. That another suggestion has also come up was the um, uh, possibility of, with a change in placement policy at Pond Cove, to utilize one of those two days or possibly parts of both to meet with, um, with parents. We have tried to set up the, the stated goal of meeting with parents, if not before, at least as soon as possible at the beginning of the school year. So those are the two reasons why the administration chose to put two workshop days at the beginning. Obviously, well, I'm not opposed to two workshop days. I'm just I felt that there would be better continuity if right, they were. Well, that though, they, we, clearly we can do it. Um, there's no. They, what I'm saying, I guess, is that there's nothing scheduled on. Let's say if we had scheduled a system-wide workshop with a speaker or something of that sort for the first, uh, for uh, yes, the first, um, that would make it difficult. But we haven't done that. They're both in-house things, so it could be moved. I think with what's on our pallet for for what we are about to undertake, I think, to bring in a high-powered speaker of any kind for the beginning of school, I think, is... We didn't intend to do that. No. <laughs> I, it's not on I was at one board member would find quite a bit of objection to that. Um, Connie, can I just ask a question about what you just said about bringing parents in to meet with the teachers? I thought we had money, may, I may be mistaken, in the budget for that to happen, at Pond Cove anyway, in August sometime, some extra money aside from... Mm -hmm. Um, these teacher days, is that? That's correct, uh, although, again, it is unclear to us exactly how much um, latitude we have as far as the condition of the building. So this is not a proposal I have seen. I just know that there's been some conversation. Right, okay. okay. Any other comments, Peter? Yeah, m my view on this uh, is that we, we shouldn't open school on a day that is a religious holiday, uh, particularly if it affects uh, some number of individuals. I don't know how many children are uh, likely to be affected, but I assume that there are at least several. Um, I don't have exact numbers, but I do know for certainty that yes, there are real living people uh, that would yeah. miss the first day of school. <laughs> so, you know, knowing that and, and knowing that uh, there are at least several possibilities of accommodating this, uh, this unusual event, uh, I think the uh, suggestion of uh, December 23rd makes sense. Uh, I think, frankly, that uh, adding uh, another day to June 22nd does not make much difference one way or another, and uh, maybe that's the easiest way. But I would support adding another day at the end of the year. Uh, I would uh, also support uh, December 23rd, uh, make that a school day. I, I just, if I could repeat why I asked for consideration for the 23rd off. Uh, again, um, specifically because of the calendar in this year, the Christmas um, holiday comes on a Sunday, and it's one of the, we all know, the widest traveled um, holiday period, uh, which is why I was concerned about the absenteeism, uh, not as a way to... Uh, encourage people not to go to school on the Friday before a vacation, uh, but because of the fact that there are so many families involved with that. So I, I just wanted, that was the rationale. Uh, we have uh, documentation on how high the uh, absentee rate will be from other years when uh, this came, and maybe if an administrator 
has some idea of how much that might be or how much more than normal. I know that we had looked at it in years gone by to, uh, to take an educated guess. Oh, I can't believe I said that. I'm, pro I'm probably going out on a limb. Child. But I, I wonder how much is accomplished on a Friday before any holiday, weekend, or, or vacation. But that's, that was, that's the, but the prerogative of parents to take their children out of school before that when it's not a scheduled day, that's their prerogative. But that's why they take their students out of school on that day as well as and, and airline parent, tickets are less. And parents keeping their children out for a, a specific religious holiday observance, I think, has a little more credibility than, um, than taking your child out because you want to travel. So I definitely would support Carla's changes. Comments, Mark? I, uh, when this was discussed at the last meeting, I, I had many mixed emotions about it and continue to have uh, those feelings. There, I think there is credibility to trying to accommodate um, religious holidays even when they may not be a part of the majority group of students. Um, the the uh, example that was present to me as my children began in public schools, which was not my experience, was Good Friday, which was always a day observed away from school and, and a religious day of observance in my family. Um, and so from that standpoint, I, I do feel some uh, sentiments of, of the disappointment of missing that holiday. On the other hand, uh, the convenience of Easter being traditionally on a Sunday holiday has never uh, been tested, and in the public school system, Good Friday is not typically observed. One, and I, I, I continue to not have strong feelings on either uh, f on either vote. Or actually, I do have strong feelings, but they seem to counterweight each other. The uh, one concern I do have, however, is the concept of uh, rearranging school calendars on the basis of religious holidays. And I think your argument concerning Christmas is certainly a legitimate one. Um, and the concept that the majority reigns is not necessarily a good argument. But I, th I think this, this precedent could perhaps be extended um, through other observances, through other religions. Um, the United States is classically a Judeo-Christian tradition, and although there are many other traditions there in a far greater uh, minority than the Judeo-Christian tradition. So I, I guess I would have some concern about uh, precedent leading to observances of several days throughout the calendar year uh, on that uh, on that argument. And so there is at least some question in my mind about the separation of, of church and state, actually, as it approaches the school calendar. I would argue um, that this is not setting any precedent, because I would clearly expect the very next year Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur would be in the middle of the month, which actually I could tell you if you wanted to know the exact dates for the next three years. And they will be in the middle of the month. And in three years from now, they will even be in October and they will not be school days. I would, again, stress that this is an anomaly and only because we're talking about the first day of school. And I would also further argue that if, perchance in some future year, some other religious holiday, no matter what religion it was, turned up on the first day of school, then it would bear uh, talking about further. Um, I really don't see what precedent it's going to set because we're just clearly discussing this only because it's the first day of school. And not, we're not talking about any other holidays within the calendar. And Good Friday is never a day off, but usually Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are not days off either. And again, Christmas is always a day off. Peter? Yeah, I think that's really the key point. This is the first day of school. We already have a policy for Good Friday. Uh, Good Friday, uh, which uh, you know, many observe, uh, the teachers are not supposed to introduce new work. It's the same for Rosh Hashanah, when it falls on a day which is not the first day of school. But the first day of school is special. I mean, think of even if one child were not able to come to school on the first day. Think of the start that that child is getting. I think that's the crux of this issue. It's the first day of school. I, um, can I just make a comment? I got a, a call from um, someone today who I think I can fairly categorize um, you know, 
call a, uh, a Jewish religious leader in this community who um, told me that, in all honesty, she couldn't justify um, the, second, the second day of Rosh Hashanah as a broad um, uh, holiday because it is not um, observed by um, all of the Jewish faith in the same way that the first day is. And I would just go back to um, you know, the fact that this, this uh, calendar already had that compromise in it of not starting school on the day when, um, from my understanding from what I was told today, the majority of people really do celebrate um, Rosh Hashanah and the se second day. Um, it's not as important to, to, that, to that many people. And I would, I would also echo what Mark said about um, you know, the very fine line we, we have to walk about between the church and state issues. Um, you know, right now you're talking about particular holidays that may not fall on a, you know, the first day of school again, but um, you know, there are a lot of other religions and with a lot of other holidays. And I think we've been consistent on this issue for a long time. And I'd like to see us stay consistent. Rosemary had it. Yeah. Well, I, I just think that this will probably take two or three motions. And if you'd like, I'll make a first motion that we accept the calendar uh, as read, as presented, uh, with the exception of the changing of the quarter date. And we'll see how that lines up, unless there's new information. Okay, do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? Um, You're talking about voting on this calendar. Voting on this calendar with the change of the quarters that um, re requested. Uh -huh. I, I want to make a discussion. Um, can I make a discussion to your comment before we vote on this, or do I, do yeah. I have to? Yeah. Just, okay. Um, well, I think I probably know the person you talked to. <laughs> Let me stress that that is one person's opinion. And some of the parents that I talked to on the phone that do observe the second day were appalled at the thought of their children missing the first day of school. One parent said to me, even if you're only talking 10 children, that's 10 children within the school system that could be accommodated, that could be accommodated without a lot of friction to this calendar. And um, they, they were really upset by the idea of their children missing the first day of school. Another parent from that parent said to me that all they want is for their child to be welcomed on the first day of school the way the other children are, and not to come in the second day without having all those kind of orientation factors that go on on the first day. And um, to start out the school year already sort of on and off foot and um, standing out differently. So I really, I guess my point was the point in the beginning that what the person you spoke to is really one person's opinion. And there are many people in the Jewish community that would violently disagree with that person. You know, I'd just like to draw a parallel uh, to Easter. And I, I, I think we're probably getting uh, into somewhat shaky theological territory if we try to settle this on, on theological issues. But uh, Easter is really a four-day holiday. Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and Easter. Uh, some people celebrate those particular days uh, differently. Uh, I don't think that's the issue, whether some people consider Rosh Hashanah a one- or a two-day holiday, or Easter a four-day holiday, or a three-day holiday, or, or maybe just one day. Uh, the issue is, is there a significant body of our community that whose children are not going to be able to come to school on the first day of school? I think we've identified that there are. It's easy to accommodate it. Uh, we're not being asked to cast it in concrete. Uh, it's probably not going to occur again for a long, long time, and we have a perfectly adequate policy to accommodate Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Easter, and Christmas. Uh, uh, I don't see this as a precedent-setting or particularly difficult decision the more I think about it. Well, if Beth wants to withdraw her second, I'll <laughs> withdraw my I just wanted to make motion. a comment. Um, the Friday the second is crossed out as just a day off. Is there any way to um, look at that? I guess I'm worried about starting school so late. I would like to accommodate you know, so that children don't miss the first day of school, but we are starting school so late. And for the kids, September is usually a month that's jam-packed with a lot of learning and getting the kids back um, up to speed and things. 
Um, and I don't know if there's any way we can start earlier. I think the building project hangs as an unknown above us all. Um, but it also, we really need the next summer too. A lot has to be done. Um, and if we keep pushing school later into June of uh, 95, we could run into some serious problems also. They need the kids out of the buildings again. Um, and um, I, don't, I don't know if there's any way to. And I would like to just clarify my statement about setting precedents. It doesn't. It wasn't precedent about Rosh Hashanah in any way. It was. It was precedent about the conscious change of of calendar based on religious holiday. Um, to me, I, I'm not impassioned about the first day of school. In fact, if my kid was going to miss the first day of school, I I wouldn't blink twice because in my mind, very little gets done on that day, and I would rather them hit a, a full curriculum day than the first day of school. For, unless perhaps it was their first day into a school system, for instance. So I don't have that emotional draw to the first day of school that, that some people do. And so for me, the, the concept of precedent setting would be throughout the entire calendar year, um, in, in addition to the, to the first day or the last day or the, or the middle day. Um, and, and that's my concern, because there are many different forms of worship. There are, are many different uh, holiday schedules that I'm not terribly familiar with. And so that would be my concern about precedent. Um, can I just ask for a clarification because, Peter, you mentioned the word a significant portion of our population. I would like to know what we're really talking about here. I don't, I don't remember ever hearing what, you know, the, what proportion we were talking about here. I don't have a specific Peter. number. Well, is it 12 or 100 or somewhere in between? I mean, somewhere we know how many. Is it 50? I have no way of knowing that. I'm sorry, Connie, I was just looking your way. I wasn't looking <laughs> at you for the answer. I mean, I just think that with all the research that has been done, we have to know what the numerical value of that research is. Why? Because it's the difference between whether or not one school board member will vote for it or against it. <laughs> <laughs> it's 300. I know that's not true. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think it's legitimate to ask that question so we know the magnitude of the issue we're talking about. I mean, if we're talking about five children and we have some other issues to balance, like the, the church and state and setting a precedent about how we deal with religious holidays, then, you know, I think, I think, it's, I think it's a legitimate question to ask. Um, so. Gail Atkins again, when you're making that count, my Catholic daughter will be missing her first day of kindergarten because she will be in temple with her brother. Thank you. I okay. question how you can make this kind of account. Well, I mean, well, we for, for most okay. decisions that we have to make, we have to know about how many people we're talking about. This has nothing to do with, I mean, the fact that we're talking about relig you know, religious matters right now may make it seem sensitive, but we in fact talk about the numbers of people affected by decisions we make all the time, all the time. Everything we do, we talk about the numbers of people we're affecting. As we will with other items on the agenda Correct. when we get to them. If um, somebody would be willing to, uh, well, we were in the middle if, of a motion. If Beth will withdraw her second, I'll withdraw my motion. I will withdraw. I withdraw. Is there a new motion? Are we going to vote on the calendar tonight? I'm not going to make the new motion. Okay, I'll make a motion. motion. I'll make a motion that we um, start school on September 8th. Second. What? Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> You've no. got to make a, another change. You got to. You got to add the. Nut. Well, as I made that motion, I thought about that, and I said, "Well, no, I don't." <laughs> Yes, you do. Uh, if I knew which one of which one of the alternatives were, were was the the more persuasive uh, of the at least two that I think we've identified, I would have proposed it. But I'm not sure well, which it I, is. I feel a travel day to co accommodate a holiday weekend is not valid. And 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 just for my departing board member, the most heavily traveled holiday is actually Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry. We go at Christmas. <laughs> well, all right, I'll, I'll try that. 
<laughs> my, my motion now stands that we start school on September 8th and that December 23rd not be uh, a day off. It'd be a school day. So do we, and what, and clarification, do yeah, we leave the teacher workshop days at the beginning of school the way they are? We need some guidance, I guess. Uh, okay, we'll, we'll call this because it's been seconded. We'll call this discussion. Discussion. Has it, has it been seconded? Carla, I second. Carla, Well, what you're asking, I think, is the um, the Scylla and Charybdis the situation uh, from the Odyssey. You may recall it, you know, two big rocks, you hit one and you're going to hit the other. Um, the reason for the workshop day before Labor Day was since every other school calendar that we've been able to contact starts both, I think everybody is starting, both staff and students before Labor Day. Now, we have been talking to people who are dealing with draft calendars as we have, but um, I, you can corroborate Connie for me, but as I'm reading this, uh, some people are starting, um, yeah, we have August 30th as a start day. Presumably that's a staff day with the students starting on the 1st. Um, September 1st, August 30th. Um, some discussion about Westbrook probably starting before Labor Day. Falmouth starting September 1st. Um, our, it was our understanding, we had two issues, if you recall, last month. One was that we had, we were aware that both the 6th and the 7th were uh, the two holidays of Yom Kippur. And since we, with that, I mean, again, I do think it's inappropriate, certainly information I would not have access to and I would not feel that it's appropriate for me to uh, either poll staff or students as to what their religious preferences were, but just taking into consideration that this is an issue that could affect both staff and students. Um, but we felt, felt more comfortable looking at it, as Mark says, really, from the, um, the separation of church and state is a real issue. And I have to tell you that I have not, I cannot t speak as an attorney, but I do know that in many times you should be making your decisions based on the, the kinds of considerations that recognize the separation. Although I certainly understand and have sympathies for the, um, the sentiments that are expressed. Um, so we were trying to be accommodating of both the fact that if we had our druthers, we'd be starting before Labor Day, as everybody else around here is. Uh, we've had two bad winters with lots of snow days. The point you make about um, the impact on the buildings in June is a very real one. And um, we have a heavy schedule for it. Anyway, that's, that's what we were thinking about. And we also were concerned, as I said earlier tonight, about the close um, asbestos you know, removal. We aren't going to get back in the buildings, at least not totally. Uh, so we decided to try to take one of the required five teacher workshop days and cluster them before with one before to get it for the practical point of view of helping people um, unpack and the second practical view of uh, giving a second faculty day on the first day of Rosh Hashanah, leaving the lessening the impact of it was sort of a compromise, if you will, on um, starting the calendar. And that's why those days are where they are. Those are the reasons. Um, your choices would be then to have question whether we should have two faculty workshop days, the 6th and the 7th. I guess that's what you were asking me. Um, I can't tell you particularly about the unpacking impact. That's just a, a judgment call. Um, but that, of course, is a possibility. Um, I don't have any definitive answer for you. Hmm? That's or the first and second. Hmm. Or the first and second. Could be two teacher days. But if you do it the first and second, then you really are impacting Rosh Hashanah. You were starting school on the sixth. And so for those families who are um, involved in that, you have certainly made this a, a worse situation than responding to this one. Rosemary. Connie, in your list, did you say when Portland was starting? Um, we didn't have a final draft, but it looked like uh, the advisory committee has suggested September start and Thursday or Friday before Labor Day. They were also very rough draft at the time. Right. Portland. Um, they, should, they may have. 
they have suggested starting on Wednesday, September 2nd. Wait a minute, that couldn't be September no. 2nd, it must be the 7th. Um, what they were contemplating was student start on Wednesday, apparently. Rick, how many kids are affected PRBTC? Next year will be approximately a dozen. So 12 students will miss the first day of PRBTC? Do they go every day at 1030? Yes. Would they be expected to go to school if CAPE were not in session? Generally not. It's, it's, it's the, the whole school uh, sending in. They would miss the first day of Portland, but it would, not be, it would be an excused uh, situation. Thank you. Mark? Um, I, I would have one comment about the, the switch of the 7th for the 23rd of December. Uh, in your opening remarks, Carla, you described trying to produce a calendar for the generalized good and the common good. And I would uh, question that choice as the day to, uh, to swap with, in that if your concept is that you want to preserve the chance for children to uh, uh, engage in their holiday uh, as prescribed by the religion, a funny day to choose to swap it with would be the 23rd. Um, I think you would, uh, this is pure conjecture, however, I, I would, I feel I would, can be somewhat accurate in it, is that you would have more students missing the 23rd than you would have students missing the 7th if that was a day of school, just because of, of the way uh, uh, the population in this town, town exists. Um, in terms of, so I just mean in terms of consistency of argument, it, it would be, it would be funny that you would choose the 23rd well, for that day. To me, it seemed a logical day because it didn't impact the end of school and because it's just a day. I mean, really, in reality, it's just a day. However, I'm not that stuck on the 23rd. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to get the 8th, we can pick another day. I mean, if that's your only sticking point. <laughs> well, no, my, my sticking point is primarily changing the calendar. But I, I, I'm cautioning that I think there would be a significant amount of negative feedback if it was changed the 23rd for Jewish holiday. And, and many people would observe, would consider that to be a part of their uh, Christian holiday, and, and I would hate to have that. Well, I would argue again that Christmas is always a day off of school, and I'll keep arguing that. I, I didn't argue that point. Okay. <laughs> point <laughs> was All right. and we... that there might be some unhappiness about it. But. Well, I, I think that it's, uh, it's stretching a point, Mark, that, that make the 23rd uh, a religious holiday. I agree it with simply the, isn't a religious holiday. I agree with I, Mark. I think you the must be clear into what I said. I did not say it was a religious holiday. What I described was that there would be a significant number of students missing and that some people might be unhappy about it. And so I just, if we are going to make the change, I think probably a, a more... Uh, a politically appetizing way to do it would be address a different date. Well, I, I agree addressing a different date, but I thought I heard you connecting the 23rd with the observance of the Christmas holiday. Uh, you had a phrase in there which made a connection. Uh, I don't think, uh, I, I think there'd be a better day. That's fine. Peter, could somebody, would somebody like to suggest another day then? Well, can, would can, like can we vote on his motion because that's now two. So we, we can vote and fail that and then Okay. All in favor of, does Wait anybody need what? to remember? Repeat, what the, repeat the motion. This is my motion, which is that we start on the 8th and we take off the 23rd. Right. That was right. your motion. Now, uh, I don't, I sense from the consensus that that's not, uh, not well, anybody's preference. We, but we should just, let's just right. finish the motion and let what happens happen. Okay. That's fine. To the motion. That's okay. Good. All in favor. Okay. Three. Three. How many opposed? Okay, four. <laughs> okay, does anybody have a new proposal? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Kyle. It's yours. Um, um, wait, let me think. <laughs> I told you it would take three. All right. Um, I move that the uh, school calendar be amended so that school starts on Thursday, September 8, 1994, and that the last day of school... Do I say the last snow day? Is that what I say? The last star day? Um, the last day of school would be the 15th rather than the 14th with five uh, days provided for snow days following that. All right, that's my motion. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Ray, okay, all, all opposed? Four, okay. This is an interesting way to draft the calendar. 
<laughs> it's actually so quite efficient. We, really. No, actually, yeah. we had a committee that yeah. did this yeah. and um, okay. that brought Voted forth this. Huh? No, but I mean, the, we can't seem to find right. the voting uh, is, is an efficient it's, way to dispose of it. Okay. I voted against the motion. We, should, we need a clarification Excuse of the vote. The clar a clarification of the last vote? Yes. yes. Um, voting in favor were Rosemary, Carla, and Peter. Okay. And opposed, Mark, myself, Charlie. Okay. And Beth. You have to make. The only reason I voted against that motion is because I think extending the school year into the summer is going to impact some, some major things that are going to have to take place to bring to conclusion the building process. So therefore, I, I truly feel that if we're going to sacrifice a day, the 23rd, as a travel day, does not make sense academically or for whatever reason. That's parents' choice to take their children. They still have essentially a day to travel, so. Would anyone like to? Again. Motion. That motion failed, though. Yes, yes. Right. Both, uh, all three of those motions have failed. Can we change the calendar to 174 days? <laughs> Would anybody like to propose once again that we look at the calendar we have before us? Oh. <laughs> Madam Chair. Um, I ask that we consider um, the school calendar as presented in draft. Is there a second? With the movement of. No, no movement. No, no, just no movement. Just as it stands. I withdrew that the first time, Connie. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm confused. She's proposing the original calendar, calendar with the change in the first term. Okay. Right. But as set up with the, key, with the change it, uh, Rick. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Yeah. Second was Beth. Okay. Any discussion? Okay. All in favor? All opposed? Oops. <laughs> <laughs> I already voted. So the motion carried. The motion carried. Moving on. Moving on to new business. We have discussion and possible action regarding kindergarten classes remaining the same throughout the year. We didn't really discuss who was going to present this. Beth, I'm happy to. Want to. Yeah, sure, I'm happy to. Um, this group of people was put together to um, discuss it. Um, pretty much at the initiation of Jean Ginn Marvin, who was very interested in. Um, re-looking at our kindergarten switching program. We met four times and we put together a survey that was given out to um, incoming kindergarten parents on their orientation night. We took those results and um, had a number of discussions about that and um, we got a lot of input from the kindergarten teachers and from um, Sue Weatherby about the bus schedule. Um, and a lot of other scheduling issues through um, Beth Henderson. Um, the recommendation from the committee is that the kindergarten students would attend a consistent morning or afternoon session for the entire school year beginning in the fall of 1994. Um, the feeling of the committee um, for this recommendation was basically based on a few things. Um, mostly, it is what surrounding communities now do, and it would um, meet the needs of a lot of parents who are um, trying to get childcare schedules set up. It would also save um, a considerable amount of administrative time in the middle of the year, as well as kindergarten teacher time in the middle of the year when the switch takes place and a lot of time is devoted to, to making that happen smoothly. Um, I don't think there's anything else um, that's of major interest, but I would love if anybody has comments on it or um, board members have questions. Just a quick comment. I just want to commend the committee for outstanding research and the amount of work that uh, went into deciding uh, what to recommend to the board. I think it's very well presented. Just, uh, just a question. 
Have there been any studies about the impact of children who, who are going to the afternoon session and making a transition to first grade, having never gone to school in the morning? What does um, that impact? There have been no studies. The kindergarten teachers wanted to stress that they didn't know if the kids necessarily learned better in the morning or in the afternoon. They see, obviously, now the same kids in the morning or and then in the afternoon and switch. And um, the only issues that they see are different are mostly the behavior problem children. Sometimes um, they might be more tired in the afternoon and therefore behave better and um, or those kind of things, but they're really nothing to do with the learning. Um, the committee felt that since all the surrounding communities now are on the consistent schedule, that if there were some um, major learning differences that happened, um, that they would have been picked up um, now. Um, certainly in the parental survey, I should note that most people want a consistent schedule, but they also want the morning. It is sort of what we come to expect as you get up in the morning and you go, and it's your best time to get things done. Um, the kindergarten teachers did note they do see kids, though, that are very rushed in the morning, in the morning session, that maybe haven't had breakfast and don't always perform as well as they should. Um, so there, there is no studies to say when they learn better. How, how far do you think we are from year-round kindergarten? Well, well, you didn't mean year. I'm not year-round. I meant all day. All day. Meant all day. I'm yeah, sorry. Oh, I heard all day. <laughs> yeah, you're yeah, good heavens. So, um, I really don't. I, I don't have a good handle on that. I've been the studies that are, or the issues I've read about that one are so often tied to urban issues and child care issues of a variety of, of kinds or, or sort of head start issues um, there and with budget problems whatever groundswell there was for that in the 80s has long since died out because um, you know it's just such an issue on uh, on staffing space and um, it just that's it's a direct result of, of a, an idea that doesn't even get examined when you have bad budget times. I should point out another piece of data. Forty students out of the yeah. out 112 that we have signed up for kindergarten for next year have also signed up for the community services extended day. Um, that's perhaps one reason why that, that's a fairly large percentage, of course, of that size class. Um, for them, I don't imagine it makes a whole lot of difference whether it's morning or afternoon, so it blunts the effect of this. I don't know quite how to interpret that, but it's an interesting piece of data. We did note that that was um, an important piece in our discussion. We also noted that the poll and you know the numbers in extended day might not be consistent year to year, that this was one group we were surveying and all, but this would be a permanent change. And we wouldn't survey again each year. No, I think it has to make something that you have to go with. The, the, the historical background of this um, is uh, I've given some thought to that, and I really don't know. I mean, it's something that used to be, and um, obviously the pressure for change on, in various communities around here is coming from pe from from changes in the uh, uh, work uh, place and need for, for child care. Gail Atkins again. Um, I guess I am concerned. I imagine uh, if the paper was correct, 25 years ago, a school board sat around and set up this schedule with the switch. And um, why did they do that? And why did they decide on the schedule that they did? Now here, the school board is again taking a look at the schedule and deciding on a change. And my feeling is that the change is not because it's going to be for a better education for the kindergarten students, which I think is what the board should be considering, but that it's going to accommodate people who need daycare. Um, I, for one, have a child uh, who is on going to be on the younger side of the children coming into kindergarten, but I have not seen any reason, either from her screening or her preschool, why she should not enter kindergarten in September, even though she won't be turning five until September 6th. Uh, I would like to add, she does still nap in the afternoons. Um, I'm willing to live with a change for half a year 
if she's in afternoons um, and half a year in the morning. But I really feel that in her case, if she is put in a strictly all afternoon schedule, she is not going to be operating at her best um, throughout the year. Granted, the second half of the year, she will be a little older and maybe getting away from these things. Um, but I feel it would be to her detriment to be in an afternoon system for the entire school year. And again, I just I feel that this change in the system is being based not on educational possibilities for these students, but purely on uh, accommodation for parents who work. Um, you said yourself, people get up in the morning, they go, they do their best work. Um, and I think that's pretty much the case with most people um, that you mo I, I think what we said that that is definitely the perception and that the kindergarten teachers really didn't feel that that was necessarily the reality that when they saw the same kids both morning and afternoon um, and they felt it would be better for the kids most of them I should say um, to be on a consistent schedule that it is very disruptive the change in the middle of the year and that they do devote a lot of time to it that could be better spent um, working on reading and writing. Um, and so I think that's really what swayed our committee was sort of the wasted um, school time spent. I mean, up to three weeks in the middle of the year they devote to preparing kids for the change and you know, teaching them the new routine and how it will be different and those kind of things. And I think that was probably the swaying um, feeling from the committee that we didn't want to spend um, that much time on such a short kindergarten day and such a short blocks of learning that we all felt, you know, were really important. We also didn't want um, our administrators and special ed um, people re spending all that time rearranging schedules when they could be, again, better spent working on other problems. I think that was really the, the major focus. Well, I'm just wondering yeah. if in another 25 years the school board is going to be sitting back here making another change. I think well, we probably well, will. I hope, I hope we, we make lots of changes. changes. <laughs> <laughs> I, hope, I hope we, we are. More often than every 25 years. Right, more often than that, I hope. Any other comments? Charlie? Your last comment, I think, is solely that it's more of an academic and um, it, it's going to benefit the kids because you're going to be able to give them three weeks more of, of structured time. And a, any other comments? Um, this is, uh, I don't believe, a vote, voting item, is it? I mean, isn't this something that we can just say, yeah, you can, go with our blessing and? Yeah, it's, it can be seen as an administrative action. However, it would be the kind of administrative action that the board certainly needs to hear, discuss, um, and give us a sense of whether you, uh, you know, uh, approve of that direction or not. If you were to go to all day kindergarten, that would clearly be a board action because there are policy and budget implications. This doesn't change our budget. Um, it doesn't stretch our transportation. Uh, it might, at first plus, I wasn't at all sure that uh, we could do this, but the way they've worked it through, um, yes, it can be arranged for transportation. So. Beth, I just want to commend you and everybody else who was on that committee for a really, uh, you know, a job well done and done in a in a timely manner. <laughs> nice to see a committee formed, do its do its job, and um, come forward with a recommendation. I think that's great. I think maybe what we ought to do is just take a informal poll of the board to see where we stand. What's the harm in taking a vote? What's the harm in taking a vote? Uh, is there a harm in taking no. a vote? Maybe not. It's just this seems like kind of a, more of an administrative kind of thing. It's we can take a vote. Well, I just think. Motion. But uh, you know, I think motion it's to accept kind of, the recommendation. I, I, I wouldn't take a vote unless we're absolutely sure it's a yeah. voting issue. Uh, doesn't strike me as a voting issue, but it's a gray area. I mean, there it's are a, yeah, you know, if you look gray. at you look at the at the uh, advice to school boards, and as we go through orientation, I'll be sure to make sure that we have this for our new school board members. There is a large gray area that boards are advised to stay out of that are essentially administrative decisions. On the other hand, it is also part of that gray area that we believe it makes for a much smoother um, operation if you are aware of the changes that 
And we've had a couple of them tonight. We've had the uh, teacher and administrative recommendations for a change in curriculum, which I definitely would, uh, would regard as a non-voting item, but an information, very important to have that information. And if, in fact, the board represents um, or hears something that is uh, of concern to them from a policy level, that's the time, obviously, to have, have a discussion about it. That's why we brought it to you. Uh, but not because we didn't see it as within our purview, just because of the nature of things. This is a little different in the sense it has some educational implications, but a lot of this is more the relationship between the community and um, and the way in which we offer services. Uh, uh, my, rec my unresearched opinion of why school boards had kindergarten as half and then switched is that originally morning sessions were longer than afternoon sessions. I know when my children are young, for instance, you've got an extra half hour in the morning. And so the switch was actually brought about for that reason. Um, but in over time, those differences have disappeared, and or at least they have here. Um, the other issue is was a, uh, originally a budget issue because kindergarten uh, was not required. Uh, districts only gradually put them in. New Hampshire, for instance, doesn't have kindergarten yet. I think it's the only state in the nation that doesn't, and there is you know ongoing discussion about mandating kindergarten. And up until the 1984 um, uh, mandates uh, for school reform in this state, it wasn't mandated either. It is now mandated. Uh, so all of those reasons, all of the above, and I have been part of some discussions where people have tried to research, is there anything to tell us that you need those changes and other than the kinds of things you're talking about where children are, and on a case-by-case -case basis, there is really nothing that guides us in that decision. These decisions are almost always made in a context of budget, scheduling, what a community seems to prefer, what makes sense, and so forth. Um, frankly, that's what it is. And the next decision we have, which is clearly a policy level decision, so you've got all that clearly in support. And we're not changing the number of hours no, a child is going to be no. in the system. Mm -hmm. I just need, to, need to, be clear, to have it clarified to me how the lottery system, is it going to be by neighborhood or... I, I need that clarification. I mean, you I think can't... Sue's got to talk on that. She's got <laughs> it figured out. <laughs> Because we do have a kindergarten run, and you know, are you proposing to put the kindergarten children on to regular? We, we are starting to plot each kindergarten student's address now on a, on a map of Cape Elizabeth. And when they determine exactly how many kindergarten sections there'll be in the AM and in the PM, we'll cluster kids, um, children divided by the number of sections, I, I assume 16, 17 children per section, and we'll cluster the neighborhoods and we'll number them, and we'll draw them out of a hat, and we'll do that annually. But you'll still still have separate kindergarten runs in, in your transportation. Just in the middle of the day. Just, just in the middle of the day. So the, the morning pickup will, will be with the elementary run? As it is now. As it is now. Okay. Mm -hmm. I do have some concern about the number of appeals you'll get, and that could be possibly well, unmanageable. I, 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 well, I think the committee plans to reveen, I mean, reconvene to <laughs> <laughs> to really nail down what we feel that those appeals, our hardships. yeah, our hardships, and um, and try to be really fair on that, and then um, and go at it that way. Um, but we haven't, you know, we've had some informal discussions about it, but we need to really. Mm -hmm. um, and also, if there if there are appeals that are accepted, um, the community is only 12 square miles, and certainly buses are going to travel somewhere near a particular resident if a child needs to be picked up. So I don't see that as, as a huge problem in terms of scheduling the buses. It's just that we've spent so much time refining our transportation schedule that I would hate to see it <laughs> unravel because. You know, I don't, th I don't think that's, a, okay, that's an okay. issue, though, because we've had this little bus appeal um, committee this, this year that I think has been very effective. There have been some, you know, a, a handful of people um, who wanted their cases reviewed, and I think um, you know Sue, Sue and I, and Connie have been doing that, and I think it's worked well, and I okay. think people have been well served and felt like they were heard, and in some cases we were able to accommodate what they wanted, and if we weren't, we could explain why. So I don't, I don't see why we couldn't work that out, and I'm sure the first year of any kind of change like this, um, we'll you know, there may may be more appeals after people see how it works. Um, you know, I, I'm confident it will work. 
I think so. So w would you say we needed a vote on this or no? We don't need no. a vote. You no. may take a vote if you okay, don't. Okay. You want to make a motion? You want to move? Oh. I put it away. I thought I had. <laughs> Um, I move that we accept the uh, Kindergarten Switch Committee's recommendation for consistent morning and afternoon sessions beginning in school year uh, 1994. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? 7-0. Okay, um, moving on to discussion and possible action on deletion of school board policy, enrollment of non-resident employees, children. Um, I know Rosemary, as the policy chair, um, has something to say. And is there anybody in the audience who would like to speak? Okay, let's let Rosemary introduce it. Okay, um, what I thought I would do is I will introduce the recommendation from the policy subcommittee. Uh, I did want a confirmation for the board members and for the public to know this is not a first and second reading situation. It is not a new policy. It is a deletion of a policy, so therefore it is one reading, one vote. Um, and also I have uh, the rationale for why we came to this conclusion, uh, which I can do either before or after the comments, whatever the chair feels is more appropriate. Why don't you just set the stage and then we okay. can get the comments. The first thing I'd like to do is read uh, the policy. Enrollment of non-student employees' children. This uh, is coming, this says uh, October 9th, 1994. Was that 1984? That's a typo, it's 1984. Persons who are actively employed by the Cape Elizabeth School Department may have their children enrolled without paying tuition provided the administrative conditions established for all non-resident students have been met and affirmed by the superintendent. The school board will be discussing tonight and voting on the deletion of this policy. Increased enrollments and overcrowding in all the buildings as well as the financial costs of this policy are the reasons for the recommendation to delete this policy. Non-resident staff who currently have students in the Cape Elizabeth schools will be allowed to keep these students in the system until the students graduate or as long as the staff member remains an employee of the school department. Siblings of those families will also be allowed to attend Cape Elizabeth schools even if they are currently too young to begin school because the school board believes that families should not have to be split up between school systems as a result of deleting this policy, non-resident staff hired after May 18, 1994 will not be allowed to enroll students in the Cape Elizabeth school system. Some background on why we came to this. We heard mention in an earlier uh, discussion about the building committee about the uh, one-town concept. I will let you know, for those who don't know, before I was a school board member, I was a town councilor. This is when this issue came to me first. Similarly situated municipal employees do not have the same treatment for their students arriving in the Cape Elizabeth schools as do school department employees. So therefore, there is a lack of parity between the town employees and the school department employees if this current arrangement were to continue. The tuition-free placement of out-of-state, excuse me, of out-of-district students has also been discussed regularly at budget meetings when the town council asks the school board for the pu per pupil cost as well as how many out-of-district students are we supporting. We've addressed it for several reasons. There is a high annual student cost of maintaining these students in our school system. We also have space concerns. With the 100% local funding of the school, we had very uh, close uh, yay and nay on that vote, and we are trying very hard to respect the taxpayers' needs. Currently, 19 out of 62 potential students are in our schools. We could have 40 more students tomorrow. 
the continuing of this non-statutory, non-qualified fringe benefit would be to allow a practice that substantially differentiates between one staff member working across the hall from another person who does not have out-of-district students to include in the system. The value to staff of this non-taxed non -taxed economic benefit exceeds over $100,000 if the student were to remain in our school system all 13 years. We are proposing to grandfather the students currently in their system and their siblings. We didn't have to do that. There was extensive discussion on that, and that was determined to be an appropriate measure. The deletion of this policy will allow for no new student enrollments by staff members for children who are not already in the system. Most school districts no longer allow this practice do the financial impact, the issue of class size, the impact on sports and co-curricular events and opportunities for the same reasons that we are considering deletion of this. We have been sensitive to the educational needs of the eligible students from this district, as well as the economic burden, the financial implications the school budget imposes on our tax rate. And that is the reason and the rationale for proposing this policy at this time. Okay, Connie. Since that meeting, Rosemary, I have done a little more checking, and there are some districts that do this, but it's all over the ballpark, so I'll kind of fill you in a little bit. Um, most of the, the, the picture is, for instance, Cumberland uh, does not allow any uh, according to the information we have, unless a faculty member is willing to pay tuition, um, Scarborough and Gorm at the present time do not have separate policies. There are times when they accept um, staff children because of the, um, uh, the, I should clarify that under the, the statute that superintendents are allowed to agree to a waiver of subsidy a waiver of tuition as long as it's a, um, a transfer of subsidy situation for situations uh, where the family can demonstrate it's in the best interest of the child. Um, and that clause is sometimes used to cover this kind of situation. But those are always year-to-year -year situations. And in fact, we have been dealing with this situation on a year-to-year. -year, um, and I have uh, followed the policy in the sense where it says conditions established for all non-resident students that requires the superintendent of the town where the staff member lives to um, send us a transfer of subsidy. The transfer of subsidy, however, simply means that the Cape Elizabeth system gets to count that student. That uh, counting means that we get a um, percentage of, uh, in line with what we get for subsidy, which amounts to about $1,200, as opposed to the state um, the, the state average, which is a little over 4,000, and our local average is a little over 5,000. Um, that 1,000 or 1,200, I guess, is a closer figure given the, the uh, subsidy level at the moment, uh, certainly covers books and paper and that kind of thing. And we have been careful not to allow this if there were too many students in any one grade level so that we would have to add a teacher. Um, nevertheless, arguably, the uh, difference between what we get by counting through subsidy uh, about 1000 to 1200 and the actual per pupil cost is a significant sum. Uh, we have found that Falmouth is continuing this policy, but they do have some fairly restrictive language. Um, and Gorham is, uh, does not have a policy on this. Yarmouth does have a similar policy. They have, however, only 13 students. And um, taking advantage of the present time, and nobody has a policy that allows or states, as this one does, um, persons actively employed. All of the situations that we could find do cover professional staff only. Becky, would you like to come up and speak? I'm Becky Swift from Pond Cove, and I drew the short straws from speaking for Rachel Clark and myself tonight. Um, we want to thank the board for this opportunity to um, address this issue tonight. And I believe you got a copy of the letter that we both wrote. And we feel our letter states our disappointment with the change in the policy, but we'd like to make three points tonight. 
Um, the first issue in our minds is one of equal accommodation. We're asking for the same opportunity that other non-resident staff currently enjoy, that of having already existing children attend the school system where they're employed. This is undoubtedly a privilege and not a right of our employment, but it has been a perk, if you will, that's been openly stated to us since we were hired eight years ago. We have both anticipated bringing our children here since their birth or adoption in my case. Our second point is the term that you've used of splitting families in your policy. The new policy states that the board does not want to split families, and certainly you're in reference to siblings, but in this particular change, our family is going to be split. We will not have the same opportunity as the other non-resident staff to be active participants in our children's education. We will not be able to do what we as educators say that we value, and that's to be a partner with our children's teachers. Certainly our professional duties come first while we're here at school, but we won't be able to take our children to school on the first morning. Even scheduling a conference in another district can be difficult. And the third one is the dollars and cents, and I know that's where your concern is, and I understand that. Um, we recognize that the current policy does need to be changed. However, what we're asking is for you to allow current non-resident staff with young children who are under school age the option of also bringing their children here, as their colleagues have had. In reality, I think we're talking about only a handful of individuals. Many non-resident staff um, do not intend to bring their families here. We're asking the board to word the change in policy in such a way as to grandfather those of us who have young children who are not yet here. Perhaps limiting admission to the system by indicating a date of enrollment, such as um, something like a non-resident staff member whose child would be eligible for kindergarten up until September of 1999, and subsequent siblings, if all other criteria would met, would still be allowed to come. Um, this is only one possible compromise that comes to mind, but we do hope that the board would consider another alternative to, to the proposed change. Thank you. Thank you. Becky? What about the baby that was born today and the staff well, I member? I think that covers 99. <laughs> if I... And the people that are hired next month? Well, it needs to come into effect. It, I mean, we understand that there needs to be a change, and we're not disputing that. And to be perfectly honest, we're speaking to those of us who have children at this moment. Um, we, we are not um, you know, asking you to grandfather people who are not married or do not have children at this point. It, we're simply do you know speaking. we've been solicited to consider that, though? Okay. So well, I mean, I'm, I'm concerned on my behalf. I'm going to be honest with you, and that's I understand. I'm but I mean, after the decision was made that current students currently enrolled. Mm -hmm. We discussed people who had children who were not of school age, and we plotted all the numbers of how many students they, that was and how long it would take to go through the system. <laughs> and then the others, I've been approached by three male members of the staff who don't have children yet, or one was born today, <laughs> who want their kids to come here because they don't want to move here. Um, I, at some point, the decision has to make, be made with all due respect to our staff for the people who live in this town and pay for that beautiful new $11.5 million structure that's going up and all other educational costs. And I've got to tell you, uh, there are a lot more of them than there are staff who want to have their kids in the school. And I just really feel this is my last, uh, you know, meeting, and I hate to sound like I'm against giving professional staff, cafeterias, bus driver, custodian, every opportunity to be at work every day and to be the best professional they can be. But the bottom line is the picture is so much bigger. But I that. don't think in reality that there are that many individuals who, in fact, have children who have any intention, given the option of bringing them here. I mean, well, at least in our we've look through the staff list, you know, I mean, we certainly don't know everyone, but um, the number of non-resident staff with young children who have an interest in bringing them here, I think, is not the numbers that we're hearing. Well, we have 42 who, who are in Resident. other districts right now whose parents are employed here that do not live in this town, who, if this policy were to continue, can be here next September when we're crunched moving kids around. I, I mean, that's the bottom line. The policy as it exists right now would allow that. Okay, Carla? Um, yeah, I think that um, actually Mrs. Swift and Rosemary are both 
in a way, saying a line has to be drawn somewhere. No one's disputing that a line has to be drawn. Um, I would support the position that Mrs. Swift has put forth as to where we draw that line. I think maybe we can shift our line a little bit. I have become more aware of the financial implications in the past couple of days, and I do admit that the financial implications are more than they do appear at the surface. However, I do think it would be quite reasonable to see the policy amended to include current staff who do have children who are not yet school age. I think that the staff members in that category had a very real and reasonable expectation based on past precedent that they would be able to send their children to the Cape schools if they wanted to. I feel if we're going to delete and change the policy, we have a responsibility to do it in as equitable a manner as we can. Um, Mark, I think you had your hand up first. Uh, one point about 40 children arriving in September to Cape Elizabeth schools, that would, they do not necessarily have that prerogative. They have that opportunity at the discretion of the superintendent pending space availability. And so that if it was the case that those 40 students would be a burden to the school system, would require extra hiring of teachers, um, would not fit in the building or in the temporaries, the answer would simply be, I'm very sorry, we're unable to accommodate you. As my understanding would be, that would be true for any of the other children up, coming up who are grandfathered in, regardless of where the grandfather line is, keeping with the concept that it's, it is a, uh, it has been a privilege that's offered. It's not a negotiated piece in the contract. In light of that, and, and with uh, my apologies to the superintendent, if it goes that way, and that it's another burden upon the superintendent, I, I do have tremendous empathy with teachers who um, perhaps came to the school system because it's a good school system both to teach and in hopes of providing education for their children that they uh, feel strongly about. and. Uh, while there is a, a, a definable line between children that are uh, currently um, accountable, uh, I, I, it is to a large extent, I think, in, at least in my mind, an artificial line uh, for, from a teacher's standpoint, whether they already have a child in the system and were fortunate enough to be of a certain age to be able to grandfather it in. And the same teachers who worked under the same um, understanding about their plans for the future I, I would be in favor, for those reasons, I would be in favor of supporting changing the uh, Godfather Clause to, or Grandfather, <laughs> Grandfather Clause. It's Grandmother anyway. <laughs> it's a, the grandfathering Clause to include um, teachers that are currently uh, actively engaged in the school system. So that's two changes. It's a change in the wording to, pr to teachers. Do you, do you mean oh, administrators? Actually, no, I, I, I misspoke. Okay changing purely the grandfathering. All right, so y your proposal is to discuss keeping all staff eligible who have children born as of today? Well, no, not a born as of today. Teachers who are currently in the school system and are actively hired, I would, I would grandfather their children even if they are not born today. I guess I just want to say that we really did discuss this a long time and we didn't want to hurt um, you know the families that are here. There has to be a point though if we all agree that it needs to stop where somebody makes it and the next family doesn't make it and whenever that happens there's going to be a bad feeling. Um, and I guess as we discussed it, this was the best compromise we could come up with. If we said we stop today, nobody else enrolls, we've got families that are split who then, you know, they've seen their little brother or sister come to school here every day. This is what they thought school was. And then we would be shutting out those children. And I, I really believe that the fairest way to stop this, because it is just a huge issue and it is a huge number, and people will say, I couldn't afford to live in Cape Elizabeth, I couldn't afford to pay those taxes, but I could get my kids there if I taught there, you know? And I just don't think it's right. Um, and I guess I really feel badly that somebody's going to make it and somebody's not, um, but it has to be drawn somewhere, and I really 
feel like if we go on and on, as Mark or Carla suggests, and say, well, if kids are born as of today, then somebody has a baby three weeks from now, and they say, but what about me? You know, I was, you know, just three weeks later, or the person that's hired this summer who has a child who's four, who can't enter that child, but somebody's child who's now two, two years later can be entered. It becomes a nightmare. Um, and, and I really, I believe you know that it, it has to stop somewhere, and somebody's not going to make it, and um, and that this is a fair a fair solution to that. Connie, <clears throat> one suggestion because it is a dilemma, and I think I really appreciate the the uh, remarks of the teachers who are here tonight. Um, I think there's a big difference between people we hire now because this is due notice, uh, and people who are in the system or have been in the system. Although I have been at great pains to tell teachers that this is a year-to-year -year situation, but I always explain the policy, uh, and it is tied to the larger policy, which I've already explained tonight about the necessity to go through the transfer of subsidy. Um, could I suggest a possible consideration here, somewhere between the, the, the two stands? Um, it would seem to me inappropriate to talk about people who aren't married who do not have children. I, that really, I think, is extending this issue far beyond what um, is really reasonable. But for those people who are already working in the system, who have been planning um, and counting on sending their children, um, I think that the board could um, uh, set a date of June 1 and ask all teachers, uh, or the, the current policy does say staff, um, you could change that in, or for this purpose of enrollment, follow the trend which is clearly professional staff. And I do not mean to be elitist about this, but I do think that the, um, the common, I don't really understand quite why it is as broad as it is here. And frankly, very few people other than teachers take advantage of it. But that is a consideration. You could ask those staff working or teachers, ask those who are working in the system to indicate to me by June 1st that they have children who are not yet of school age and, and have a pitch their case. What is the reason that they want? Um, and I could come back to you and tell you what the number is and that that becomes the final step. That's a compromise between what you're talking about now and the total 1999 full ended. In other words, the burden would be on staff currently employed to make known their intention by June 1st, and I think that tends to uh, both give us a sense of what there is out there and also say that is the final thing. That's just a suggestion. Can, can I just make one point about that? Is is that Every, every year now we seem to grapple with the, with the problem of kindergarten enrollment. True. Last year we had a you know, big hullabaloo about the class size. Um, this year we had to downsize by half and that caused its own set of problems. And um, you know, one, of, one of my reasons why I would support this policy the way it now stands is we did look at whether we had anybody coming in um, you know, who had gone through screening this year. Well, that would obviously have an immediate effect, effect. Those kids would have already gone through the screening would be expected to go here. Um, there were no kids um, uh, in, in that case. Um, I just think with the issues um, that we're facing with the up and down enrollments that we can't control, we don't seem to be able to get a good handle on um, how many kids are coming in. This year we have, what, about 113 right now. Last year we had 165. Um, I, think, I think this is a, this is a factor, one of the very few we can control um, in, in relation to um, enrollment. And I have two other points, and um, they are that um, I, I certainly understand what you're talking, you know, what you're talking about, how this affects you um, as a family, and you know, I'm I'm sorry if it if it's hard on your family um, in some way. Though I don't, I certainly don't think it's as hard as if we had, if you had kids in the system and we told them they had to leave or something. Your kids haven't started yet; they don't have an expectation of what school is or that kind of thing, and it's your life decision to live in the community you're living now, which I, I don't know where it is, but um, this is asking the taxpayers of this town um, to support this per um, for our staff, um, and it's a substantial amount of money. Right now it's about $100,000, and just to give um, people you know, an idea of what $100,000 means here is we just had to go through the process of cutting $100,000 out of our budget. And it wasn't real easy. And it just seems to me we've got to put 
um, you know, the brakes on, on this kind of thing because the idea of making budget cuts is far from over. We're going to be faced over and over and again, um, you know, with, it, with the need to, to look at our budget. And I think this is, an, is a reasonable place to look and in, in a reasonable way. Carla? I just still really feel strongly that this is a fairness issue. <clears throat> and what Connie said about due process for new hires and even for people who aren't married and don't have children. It, it really it boils down to a fairness issue, and I don't think people can be penalized for what age their children happen to be. Um, I also um, feel that your word perk was actually a word I was going to use in a way. In the business world, companies offer all kind of, kinds of perks and incentives and benefit packages, and there might be some of our high-quality staff members that were attracted to teaching in our schools, and we might have I mean, you can measure cost in many ways, is what I'm trying to say. And we have some excellent staff members that don't happen to live in Cape Elizabeth. And this might have been a benefit that helped tilt them in the direction of Cape Elizabeth. I also would add that I, I have to comment on this, Beth. And I, I really can't honestly believe that people choose to teach in Cape just so they get a chance to, to use the schools. I, I really can't believe that people do. actually do that. Well, I, I can't believe that, Rosemary. And I just feel very strongly that this is a fairness <coughs> issue and that we will be very unfair if we penalize current staff for what I, I guess maybe we should ask why they do want to send your kids to CAPE. Is it just to share, to be able to be part of their education or is it because you feel the school system is better? Um, I mean, I guess, you know, you have to tell us why you want to send them if, if that's, you know, what Carla's... It's a combination of Yeah. yeah, and certainly working parents face that all the time and how they are be able to be part of their kids' education when they don't work where their children are at school. Can I just point out one thing about what Carla said about the perk? And um, I know you weren't on the board at the time, Carla, but we had a big problem with cash and loan benefits and all that kind of thing. And I have to tell you, I'm a strong proponent of if you have a benefit that you want to give somebody, you quantify it and you you put it in writing and you negotiate it. And if we want to negotiate some kind of benefit, that's a whole other area. But right now, to have some kind of squishy perk that some people get, and it's based on what they you know, talk among teachers about what's expected, um, that to me is not, it's not a true perk. And that's not the kind of perk we should be offering. Well, I'm willing, to, I'm willing to agree with you on drawing the line on the policy. I'm just disagreeing on where we should draw the line. <laughs> right. OK. Um, Charlie, I think I didn't say it first. The investors in this corporation, the school system, are the taxpayers of this community. We are elected members from this community. So therefore, we are vested to give the children of this community the best education with, with certain amount of constraints on, on spending. So that is our first duty. And, and one of those duties is to hire the best teachers that we can. But that is not necessarily to, to give them a perk which which is not being subsidized by them. And, and, and I feel it's time to make a break in the policy, and I probably would support the policy of the way it's written. You'd support a policy of what? The way it's written. The way it's the, the well, grandfathering the clause, the deletion of the, of the policy and the grandfathering clause. OK, Carl. I, I don't want my perk comment to overshadow what I really feel is the issue, which is fairness. And I'm not arguing about deleting the policy. I'm just arguing where we, where we draw the line. OK, Rosemary. Connie, I'd like to know how many um, students are allowed in and then asked to leave in your four years. In, uh, we've had, I've had no uh, situations that have involved faculty, staff, children. Um, and we've had a few circumstances uh, for instance, the clause I mentioned earlier, which is a state statute, two superintendents can agree um, to waive tuition as long as there's transfer of subsidy in the best interest of the student. There are examples of times, and I, I think I've had a couple here. I'm trying to sort out in my memory from my Gorham years and, and Cape years. Um, this most typically happens at high school where there are family members who may take a youngster in who for whatever reason wants to get a fresh start and sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't and uh, but those have not had anything to do with this particular issue and in the last uh, three or four students that have been allowed 
to come in, have all those teachers been cautioned that they had to wait and see about the class size and anything, any time than that occurred, absolutely. In fact, I had one circumstance a couple of years ago when we had um, tight divisions in, in a grade that I uh, informed the, the teacher that the, uh, the child couldn't start school. We had to wait to see what the size of the uh, enrollment actually turned out to be. So this opportunity has been generally known to be totally up to the discretion of the superintendent at which time the, they presented their student as a possible enrollee, right? Well, every, anything I've had to do within the last four years, I've gone through the same explanation with each teacher. Uh, I've, the administrators have, and I have talked about this. I did find that people had a generalized impression, which I think, unfortunately, appears to be the case here, that it was sort of automatic and that if you made that decision, there, was no, there were no other um, circumstances. Um, and I have explained to people that this is, as it says here, uh, meeting all other circumstances, which are <laughs> no undue impact on the educational program of resident students, uh, which I have translated into meaning no need to hire the teacher because we do get some money through the, the transfer of subsidy. I just think it's important for the general public and for board members who might not have been on the policy uh, committee level discussion of this, that in fact there were two staff members who were not advised until very late whether or not their students could even come in this year with the policy in effect as stated. So this is not or should not be a surprise. Well, I think the difficulty is that, um, and I, I really, I, you would have to tell me, you know, your perceptions, but um, I, I don't know if in your hiring process this was stated to you. I do not know. You'd have to tell me. But I know that certainly um, in my time here, I've read the policy very carefully and, in, and interpreted it exactly as I have said. And, well, as, and in fact, to me when, I, when I was hired, and as I understand it, from hearing from a teacher who was hired two years ago, she also was told of the policy at that time. Not by me. Because the the policy, I mean, for instance, if I I don't remember explaining that to anybody, but if in fact I have forgotten, I would, and I've been extremely careful because I have found people misunderstood that that there was an automatic right to this, and I have been very careful to explain that it is not a right; it is something that is a benefit that, well, not a benefit either for that matter, but a policy which the board at any time could review, and I wanted people to be aware of that and that all other things being equal, it's policy in effect. So I'm not sure what you're talking about in that case, but I don't happen to remember that, but I know that that's the way in which I would have explained it. Can, can I just clarify one thing about what you said? So every year, um, teachers are aware that they have to reapply to Yes, you. every okay, teacher, so whether it's just every, every staff member so is asked um, to submit a letter, and it's transfer subsidy the state requires this of us, all non-resident students, whether it's a uh, local policy or not, we, uh, with their computer forms that are filed there, we are, they're double checked. They do that because they want to be sure that we're not double counting students. And um, I require that of all of our transfer students, whether they're tuition or, I mean, excuse me, staff or um, one of the other circumstances. And I've explained that to everybody. And we send out letters, and we have that routine in effect. Mark has been <laughs> trying to get a word in edge for a long time. Mark. Uh, the concept of negotiating uh, benefits uh, was brought up by Ann, and I think it is a critical piece. I think it is important to remember from a historical perspective that recruitment is a form of negotiation. And whether explicitly or implicitly, uh, provided to the teachers, they had some understanding that as a part of their recruitment package, there was a possibility right. that they would be able to have their children attend the school. Right. And I think that very clearly was handed out to the teachers. Not only was it handed out perhaps implicitly, but it was a, it was the practice. Right. So if they would ask a teacher how to cope, well, it's no problem, my child's in school. Right. So not only was it implicitly given as a recruitment tool, it was the standard of our system, very clearly. And to that extent, I think, at least in my mind, the intent was to achieve the best possible education for our students. And the way we did that was by recruiting what we felt to be the best teachers we could recruit. And we used all means at our disposal to do that. And that included the possibility of those teachers, students, 
or teachers' children being students in our system. So from that standpoint, I, I agree with um, Carla that it, to me there is a strong sense of fairness about meeting our obligations, though they may have been implied, there certainly was the understanding of the teachers. So I would uh, feel very strongly that uh, I think the superintendent's suggestion is a reasonable resolution of the problem, and I would not feel good about uh, supporting the policy as written before us. Rosemary. Well then, since this is gonna be a two or three motion, I will, if I may, Madam Chairman, make a motion that we accept the deletion of the policy of enrollment of non-resident employees' children as written with the exception of a change of October 9th, 1994 to October 9th, 1984 due to a typographical error. Is there a second? I second it. Any discussion? We'll yes, just, I'd, uh, I'd like a clarification of the uh, the dates there, which I had not. It's the oh. date in the, um, up, up at the top in the heading. In the heading, it's just a typo. Right, right there. That should say 1984. Oh, okay. Rather than 94. That motion was to vote on this as written as, now. as it stands. Okay. You're saying okay. Any as presented as it is. Well, before we vote, then I do feel that well, I need we, to. We need a second yet. Or, no, we uh, have a second, second. Yeah. Charlie. I really do need to um, reiterate what Mark and I have said, and. Um, and when you made the point that if someone had a child who was of age to have gone through kindergarten screenings, they would have been okay. I think it's really unfair if someone has a child a year younger than that to say, you're not okay. And I just, before you vote on this motion, I just really, again, want to. So my, my point in saying that was that, that this gives due notice, um, you know, a year and a half to any other potential children um, who are out there that this change has, has been in effect and gives, gives families a, a time to make alternate arrangements, whatever, whatever they may be. Right, but I, I do think it is unfair, as, a, as I've repeatedly said and as, as Mark okay. seems to agree with me. I Peter? Want people. Yeah, I, I actually <laughs> did try to get this in a little earlier, but I'm gonna get it in now. Uh, I now have two parts to my comments. One is, uh, I think there is a fairness issue, and uh, while I haven't been thinking about this for many days, I've been thinking pretty hard in the last couple of minutes. Right. Uh, it, it seems to me that the teachers that are on the payroll who have children that are already born and who have a, had a reasonable expectation, as many of you have pointed out, uh, you know, ought to be given the benefit of the doubt if we possibly can. And I, I do see it as a fairness issue. So I think where I would come down, and I think this is uh, your, your recommendation, uh, Connie, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that that it be precisely that, teachers already on the payroll with existing children and future siblings, if any, be grandmothered. <laughs> Grandparent. Well, my suggestion was that that would be, be uh, tied to a notification yeah. by June 1st. Right. Right. In other words, a decision. And, and subject to the year to year. And subject to all yeah. the other conditions. Do you mean uh, notification of intent at some point or notification for. Notification. Next year? I think that what I, my suggestion was that for those teachers um, in, on, on, uh, in our employee at the present time who had the expectation they could do that, who already have children and who are looking forward to doing that, that they notify the superintendent by June 1st of their intentions and have an opportunity for a discussion of what those year-to-year -year conditions are so that they know. Okay, um, Scott. Yeah, I'd like to know, is that, uh, is that made, motion made strictly for? It's not a motion. That's not a motion. Okay. No, no, I was just that. explaining. That's what I was gonna clarify. That's what I was gonna clarify. Peter said teachers and we need right. to know. But we're still talking about a pending motion. Yeah. That's okay. right, and, and, is, and that, that is the, the pending motion clearly says non-resident staff. Right. By, that was my intent. I, I said teachers, I think, uh, without having uh, reflected very much on 
the implications of that. I, uh, but, but what I'm trying to make clear is we're talking about a pending motion right now, which is to leave things as they are. We're not <clears throat> that within is this motion. This is not an amendment. Uh, does yeah. any other? Well, the only other comment I would make is, you know, I really do understand that there is a feeling that, you know, we're cutting this off from somebody, but we're going to be cutting it off to the unborn child of someone who's hired here now and they haven't had kids yet and they're going to be, somebody's going to lose out. And I guess the only way I can sort of balance the sort of the, the promise we make to taxpayers to really look at our budget is if the non-resident staff are willing to pay tuition as they do in other towns. Um, I mean, and pay what it costs to send the child here um, and, you know, make it equitable, equitable that way. Um, I mean, that's another consideration. Yeah, I have, to, I have to be honest here and say I understand that when policies change, it's often difficult. We tried to make it as painless as possible by making sure no kids who are currently in, in the system would be affected. This gives, you know, at least, you know, I don't know the ages of your kids, but um, at least a year's, you know, notice it, to adjust um, to this decision. I, you know, I've got to say I've worked in a lot of companies um, in a lot of different fields and policies, you know, sometimes change. Um, and, you know, you, <laughs> there are going to be people who are affected. We try, you know, I think in this, in this uh, wording we tried to uh, make it equitable, but I have to continue to bring it back to, you know, our broader responsibility to the taxpayers of this town um, who, are, who are paying for this benefit. And um, I know that over the years I've heard a lot from them, um, and uh, I have to say I'd have to come, come down on this one on the side of the taxpayers because I believe that this, this policy is a fair policy. I think it gives due, due notice and takes into consideration the kids in the system now. Charlie? I don't think we can be fooled by uh, Rosemary's comment that the, the mill rate is going to only stay at 1770. We had a reevaluation in most people's taxes in this community because their properties, other than Peter's, went up. <laughs> <laughs> most of us, our taxes, <laughs> though the mill rate will stay at 1770, <laughs> will be paying more taxes. So I think you have to be sensitive, like I am, to the. Uh, May, may, may I uh, offer a rebuttal, <laughs> Madam Chair? Uh, my, my evaluation went uh, down because it turned out I had been overpaying taxes for five or six That's years true. because I, they had overestimated the value of my house. The only reason I made that comment was because you made the I papers. <laughs> yes, it did look bad. I know. Mark? Hey, this, this is an unusual comment for me. Um, be, but it looks as though we have some ideas where this vote is going to go. The thing that I find in my own personal um, life that I, I really absolutely want to keep my commitments to people, and I just feel awful about not being able to do that. Carla? I don't want to have to keep saying the same thing over and over again, but I'll try it one more time. And I do agree with Mark. and. I also do agree that it's okay to change this policy. I just think there's a, a much more fair and even a less hostile way to do it than this way. And I really don't understand why so many people are so opposed to grandfathering staff that have children. That doesn't seem like such a difficult thing to me. It just doesn't. Because it's a lot of money from, from my standpoint and because it gives fair notice and because there was never a commitment that I understand that, that. Staff could I understand that, and the policy okay. will will be ending. Okay. It's it's getting a line drawn. Okay. It's just a different line drawn than this. Okay, and um, I think we should probably take Call. a vote, take a vote on this, and see see how it goes. Okay, so all in favor? Oh, I just ahead. want to make one more comment. You know, leaving it to the discretion of the superintendent, which is where it should be, but I can tell you from past history with the exception of the superintendent, that, <laughs> though, we have. that we, we have not had a good history of that. So, and we will not always have Connie here. I know this is something that we can look at from year to year. So. We need to hire somebody who can do that same job. Oh, I agree. Period. We, I, I, making policy on betting on poor superintendents is a concept I cannot understand. No, but we're continually trying to fix things that were done by previous poor superintendents. Um, all in favor? 
Are all opposed? Three. Motion carries. Moving on to um, policy first reading of assignment of students to classes, five year olds. Uh, the assignment of students to classes for five year olds filed JECDA is uh, a result of a Title 20A MRSA Section 5201.2. Um, regulation. It says that the main school law permits children who are at least five years old on October 15th of the school year to enroll in school. The intent is that these students begin their school careers in kindergarten at this age. However, it is recognized that exceptions to this initial placement may be justified under limited circumstances as an acceleration at any grade level. In such rare cases, enrolling five-year-old students may be placed in first grade at the discretion of school officials in accordance with the following. A, social and emotional maturity shall have been demonstrated such as to predict success in grade one. B, the decision of placement lies with the principal, <coughs> appealable to the superintendent whose decision, decision shall be final. C, the right must be reserved to the school to administer testing as appropriate to making a proper determination of placement. D, any such placement is to be conditioned upon demonstrated success and reviewed at appropriate intervals. And E, all exceptional placements are to be reported to the superintendent. The superintendent shall promulgate regulations, procedures to implement this policy. Um, frankly, this probably seems like a surprise. Where, where did this come from? This is, uh, it's coming because the legislature passed a uh, uh, piece of legislation in the past session requiring all boards to have such a policy as this. That's why it's here. Um, it's not an issue that crops up very much. Um, there will be some interest in this, um, and it really amounts to placing five-year-olds in first grade. Sometimes it's going to be appropriate, sometimes it's not. And this is simply an attempt to respond to that piece of legislation, make sure we have a policy that we need, and that um, as far as regulations or procedures to implement this policy, clearly that would be the um, a policy, I mean, a procedure where the, the uh, similar screening processes we use for kindergarten would be employed, and there would be discussion among the principal and the appropriate staff. I would just comment, I guess Steve Simon has uh, given up and gone home. No. I would just comment that to me, I'm sorry, you know, to see the state meddling of what I think should be our, our policy setting. But I really don't know the background of the discussion, but um, I certainly think it's something that um, that's a suggested wording. I have no comments or criticisms or changes. I think it's an acceptable policy. It stands, and we can move it into June with a second reading. <laughs> okay, moving on to school parking regulations. Do you want to? Yeah, I think uh, I myself have not really studied these at any great length. I've been party to some of the discussions because of the um, they've come up at both the zoning board and the planning board. Um, I certainly don't see anything here that we have any that I know about internally that's a problem. I understand that there will be a public hearing to discuss these in, on July 11th, and uh, I'm simply placing this on the agenda so that you are aware of it and that anybody has any comments or suggestions, let me know. Rosemary? Just that the town council um, basically said that the uh, public safety chiefs of police and fire would be um, giving input and that the town council ordinance committee will not be reviewing this and they're giving a uh, or suggesting uh, during this uh, building phase that there be uh, some, or at least some of the counselors were suggesting that there be some leniency uh, with the parking because of the displacement of some of the parking places. But there are certain areas, uh, public safety access particularly, which will not be part of the soft uh, opportunity to violate the current signage. My, my only comment about this would be that 
I would hope somebody would be in touch with our clerk of the works or, or something because these were written, you know, in a vacuum without knowing, you know, all the ramifications okay. of the construction site. And if they would like to discuss it with him, I think he would probably have more pertinent input than than we possibly could. Right. I at don't. At this point, I, we're just I, we don't know what effect this would okay. have. Okay. Mm -hmm. We can do that. Okay. No more comments. Okay. Um, moving on to personnel requests. Mm -hmm. Number one on here is a uh, resignation. You have a letter in your file from Gil Donatelli, who has been working here as our high school music director, band director, um, co-producer of the musicals. Uh, we're certainly very sorry to see him go, but he is returning to his home state to an opportunity that he's looking forward to. And um, so he is leaving us. And I do have some appointments on staff. Do you want me to move right on those? Or do you don't want to take that Any separately? Any preference? Do you want to take the resignation separately from? Okay. Any motion, Rosemary? So I move that we accept the uh, resignation of Gil Donatelli. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? 7-0. <clears throat> Um, moving on, we also, um, and this is, I indicated this as we were um, additions to the agenda, uh, one of our most recent uh, budgetary decisions was to reduce the kindergarten sections from eight to seven. Uh, we had some internal discussion about uh, how best to do that. In the meantime, uh, one of our staff at the kindergarten who had uh, made a request earlier in the year to go she'd been on half time leave of absence um, and she had made the request to go back to full time status which we reviewed and you voted on uh, and due to a some change in her circumstances she has come back with a, a request for a half time leave of absence um, that's Deborah Jordan Pearson um, that is what she would like to do um, and uh, her circumstances now seem to make that possible. Obviously, that does solve our dilemma of how to deal with the kindergarten situation, and I um, am sure you will listen to her request favorably. Um, I think that does require a separate vote. That requires a separate vote from the new teachers? That's correct. Okay. All right. Is that a one-year request? Excuse me? Is that a one-year request? Those are yes, all one-year requests. Right. The status of this is that Deborah Jordan Pearson is on, was originally on a full year contract <coughs> and um, has had a series of one year requests for child care leave of half time and this is an extension of that but all of those requests have to be reviewed year to year. Okay, Rosemary? I'll move that we accept the request for a one year half time leave of absence by Deborah Jordan Pearson. Second. Second. Okay, Charlie, any discussion? All in favor? Seven zero. Thank you. And moving on, as I said at the beginning, we do have, of course, at this time of year, uh, we're advertising actively, um, interviewing. We had some uh, uh, one-year people with positions that now have turned into full-time positions, and so we are using this opportunity to nominate for appointment. That would be, um, and I have included in your packet, I'll start with a new hire. Sarah Franklin, and I've given you at least the beginning of her resume and past work history. I know Sarah, have known her professionally on, on again, off again over the last 20 odd years. She is absolutely one of the finest English teachers that I personally have met. Um, she has a long and distinguished career and um, is at the stage in her her career interested in coming back from a larger school system to a smaller one. Um, she did have an opportunity to glance over some of her um, educational background, the many, many projects she's been involved in. She's, I know personally of her involvement with the National Endowment for the Humanities. She's had many, many um, seminars through that. She has also been a very proactive person. You will see recent professional activities, which almost fills a page. Um, of um, really exciting things that she brings with her. She's also interested in um, debate uh, activities. She's been involved with that actively, um, understands our programs, and is um, 
has a great deal of admiration for them. You will see that she actually started her teaching career in Cape Elizabeth some years ago. Uh, came back briefly for a year before she moved on to uh, Deering, where she is currently. I'm just delighted to nominate her. Very strong. And she went to my college, so. Okay. Gee, I hadn't noticed that. <laughs> 62, right? Well, I, that wasn't my year. Oh, <laughs> my. <laughs> <laughs> See, I was. Um, she set. was 62. <laughs> And um, I should also note, that since we have another full-time position and a one-year position, we are well into the interview process on that, and I anticipate being able to bring back at our June meeting uh, the full roster for the English department. Uh, going on, we have Alicia Smith, who has been a teacher on staff, but her positions have been um, uh, one-year positions um, to fill uh, various maternity or, or leaves of absence. Um, and finally, she will be on continuing contract with a um, bona fide appointment, if you will, that it's not tied to somebody's um, absence. Lisa Schmidt, grade three. Mary Dulac, grade three, who's been with us this year on a one-year uh, contract, again, filling in for a um, leave of absence. She would be going on second-year probationary status. Paige Brown, whom we hired during the year uh, in the French position, but anytime we hire staff for a position, we always make it clear that that is less than a year and that we will be asking them to reapply and reopen it, which we have done, and, and she certainly is our candidate. And the same thing for Dwight Ely, who was filling in this year for Randy Ray in his first year in the administration. Um, we're delighted that he's coming back with us now on a regular full-time status, second year probationary. And that's my slot for now. Okay, do I hear motion? I move Go. that we accept the <laughs> superintendent's recommendations for nomination as new teachers for school year 94-95. Second. Peter? Any discussion? All in favor? 7-0. And uh, finally, we have included in your packet nominations for co-curricular activities. 94-95 and athletic coaching positions for fall 94-95 and we um, they're not a uh, complete roster there are some PBAs there but we are trying to meet the contract deadline of I think it's June 5th and we don't have another meeting before then so some of these will have to be filled in later and in fact my experience has been that some of these actually do get changed because people haven't made final um, decisions but this is what our best understanding at the present time is I just wanted to make the comment for people who might not know the uh, team leader grade six is not a shared position. The, Joe Doan's name should be there. Yes, that's right. correct. <coughs> should have been the last time. Okay, do it. Nancy. I just, I've been away at a conference, and so when the call came over, I wasn't there. We also, in the fifth grade, um, we do have a name for that. That would be Gilbert Earl, better known as Buddy Earl. Um, will be is our nominee for fifth grade team leader, and as Rosemary said, Joe Doan is our nominee for the sixth grade position. Thank you, Beth. You, you, you have place. some uh, positions to fill. Me? We have one additional one um, for kindergarten. Ted Demille. <coughs> kindergarten. Okay. Mm. okay. Anybody else? Rick, do you have any? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I'd entertain a motion. Okay, I move we approve the list as submitted and as modified. That's a pretty <laughs> motion for your motion. <laughs> Four score. <Right. laughs> What's your I leave the motion. Second. Right. Okay. All right. <laughs> second. Okay. Any discussion? Okay. All in favor? Seven zero, and I uh, think we've come to the end of our, our agenda. Uh, so, no, um, athletic. Oh, that was just co-curricular. Yes. Correct. Athletic. Okay. I move we accept the athletic list as submitted. Any changes? Second. Any discussion? I just have a question. Are we going to have any other soccer coaches this year than the ones on this list? Are you asking me? 
I'm just asking. No? Good. All right. Good clarification. Who seconded everything? I did. Oh. Okay. All in favor? 7 0. And now we're at the end of that. And this, I would um, entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Here, here. The meeting is adjourned.